Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. I finally did it. I've gotten through the second Twilight book, New Moon. That's what today's video essay is going to be about. These take a long time to do, so please make sure you support this video. Subscribe, we're trying to get to 200k. Do all the other functionary stuff. Also, if you can't get enough of me, I do indeed have a second channel. If you miss the shorter content, that is where that is migrated to. This channel is just going to be focused on the long form stuff. So if you only want to see me once a month, stick around here. If you want to see me a few times a week, go over there. I also have a TikTok. Make sure to follow that for more A-star content and a podcast that I swear I update weekly. Check out the podcast channel as well. Me talking to people who are more interesting than I am. Without further ado, let's get on with it. So at the beginning of New Moon, they tell us, Stephanie Mayer graduated from Brigham Young University with a degree in English literature. How did she buy the degree? I mean, and within the thanks and gratitude section of the intro. And finally, thank you to the talented musicians who inspire me, particularly the band Muse. There are emotions, scenes and plot threads in this novel that were born from Muse songs and would not exist without their genius. So we have Muse to blame for this. Cheers, mate. <laughs> also, Linkin Park, Travis, Elbow, Coldplay, Marjorie Fair, My Chemical Romance, My Chemical Romance, have all been instrumental in staving off the writer's block. You're joking me. Oh, goodness. <laughs> These violent delights have violent ends, and in their triumph die like fire and powder, which, as they kiss, consume. Romeo and Juliet, Act 2, Scene 6. The way she's kind of sort of calling herself Shakespeare here, at least putting herself within the same realm of category as Shakespeare. Did you know that there is a popular interpretation that the play Romeo and Juliet is actually a satire of romance? <laughs> Which I can believe because it's over the top and quite stupid. Oh, we'll say in love. No, there are a pair of idiots, impulsive, Idiots. <laughs> so I can believe that it's this satire, a, a, a dark satire of the romance genre. Shakespeare knew how to write romance, he knew what he was doing. But anyway, this is all very ironic because Twilight is a satire of real fiction. Preface. I felt like I was trapped in one of those terrifying nightmares. The ones where you have to run, run till your lungs burst, but you can't make your body move fast enough. My legs seemed to move slower and slower as I fought my way through the callous crowd, but the hands on the huge clock tower didn't slow. With relentless, uncaring force, they turned inexorably toward the end, the end of everything. At first, I didn't know what on earth this was referencing when I first read this because I thought nothing action packed happens in New Moon. So what's with all this drama? Until I remembered that this is the moment where Bella stops Edward from sparkling all of Italy to a glittery death. It's really not as interesting as Maya wants it to be. But this was no dream. And unlike the nightmare, I wasn't running for my life. I was running to save something infinitely more precious. My own life meant little to me today. Yeah, your life means little to me too. I knew I was too late, and I was glad something bloodthirsty waited in the wings, for in failing at this, I forfeited any desire to live. Right, spoiler alert, she thinks that Edward is going to die, so she's thankful that the Volturi are going to rip her to shreds for existing. Because she doesn't want to be alive without Edward in the world. Edward, I just saw Bella talking to Jacob. Sounds perfectly reasonable. Chapter 1. Party. So we've had to put up with a preface, which is just a teaser for the ends of the book. Bit pointless in my opinion. And now we're beginning with a dream sequence, which is my favorite, as you know. By the way, check out the first video that I did on this, the first Twilight video, to see my hatred of dream sequences in some books. Bella thinks she is looking at her grandma, who looks like a dried apricot, and then Edward appears. Well, Gran, you might have noticed that my boyfriend glitters. It's just something he does in the sun. Don't worry about it. How is this not satire? Bella realizes that she's looking at herself in the mirror and she's old and shriveled, whilst Edward is young and hot. This is her biggest fear, her being old and wrinkled whilst Edward is young and hot. Even though rich men have been doing this for literally thousands of years, what a double standard. Bella awakens with a start. 
Only a dream, but prophetic enough in one way at least. Today was my birthday. I was officially 18 years old. I'd been dreading this day for months. Literally shut the hell up. I was a fetus when I was 18, all right? I don't wanna hear about how you feel old. So do not test my patience, moaning about aging. No fully developed prefrontal cortex, no opinion. And now that it had hit, it was even worse than I feared it would be. I could feel it. I was older. Every day I got older, but this was different, worse, quantifiable. I was 18 and Edward never would be. He is older than your great grandfather, you absolute weirdo, what a fake problem to have. Bella thinks now that she's 18, she's going to have wrinkles. I'm going to need Botox after the frowning this book causes me. <sighs> Bella feels like crying. Honestly, same. Then she goes to school. I spotted Edward leaning motionless against his polished silver Volvo, like a marble tribute to some forgotten pagan god of beauty. No. Bella has been dating Edward for six months now. I'm sure that this is important to the plot. Alice is next to Edward and she has a gift, even though Bella is like, hey, no gifts for my birthday. And I worked out, this is why Anna doesn't like receiving gifts in Fifty Shades of Grey. Go check out those two videos as well. It's faux humor. I know that some people don't enjoy receiving gifts and like in that case, he's a billionaire. So you'd feel like you're being bought off. But clearly Anna didn't like it because Bella doesn't like it. And Bella doesn't like it because she has faux humility. This is meant to make her look like a good person that she doesn't like receiving gifts from the rich Cullens. But really we know that it's all fake because this book is just fake. This is all bullshit. Anyway, she finally seemed to process my mood. Okay, later then. Did you like the scrapbook your mum sent you and the camera from Charlie? I sighed. Of course she would know what my birthday presents were. Edward wasn't the only one of his family of unusual gifts. Alice would have seen what my parents were planning as soon as they decided that themselves. I cannot think of a less annoying superpower to have when it is this mundane. Really, that's your superpower. You can see the gifts that's all... That... Annoying! Bella focuses on Edward. What else is new? <laughs> and then he lifted his free hand and traced one cool fingertip around the outside of my lips as he spoke. So as discussed, I'm not allowed to wish you a happy birthday. Is that correct? Guys, I think this is their version or second base. Finally, some actual character development around here. Alice laughed and the sound was all silver, a wind chime. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like Alice is more like one of the elves from the Eragon inheritance cycle instead of a vampire, but okay. There's some back and forth about Bella feeling Edward than older. Bella feeling Edward than older. Bella feeling Edward than older. Did I just glitch? Which is absolutely preposterous seeing as he is a centurion and he also has the accumulated knowledge to match those years. Whereas Bella is a barely functioning 18 year old who can't walk down a hallway without tripping over. And I suppose if I could be sure of the future I wanted, sure that I would get to spend forever with Edward and Alice and the rest of the Cullens is with a boyfriend for six months. I couldn't really see Edward's point to be honest. What was so great about mortality? Being a vampire didn't look like such a terrible thing. Not the way the Cullens did it anyway. Yeah, let's see how you feel after 10,000 years of existence. <laughs> the everyone tries to kill each other. Alice is planning a birthday party for Bella at the Cullen's house. Bella tries to resist, but her wants are overridden because she's a human toy for these vampires and then her and Edward go to class. No one bothered to stare at us as we took our usual seats in the back of the classroom. We had almost every class together now. It was amazing the favours Edward could get the female administrators to do for him. Ah yes, the amazing vampiric ability of, um... Getting classes swapped round. Then there's this weird detail that Mike Newton finally got over his crush uh, of Bella, yet now he styles his hair just like Edward. She is clueless. Attention is never a good thing, as any other accident prone klutz would agree. No one wants a spotlight when they're likely to fall on their face. 12 pages in and we already have to hear about how, hey, 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 she's not perfect, she's not a Mary Sue. <laughs> she is clumsy. She does fall on her face a lot. <laughs> what an idiot. Bella explains that she didn't grow up with much money, but she didn't mind. But Edward is rich because Alice can predict stock market changes and that would be so much more interesting than this. Vampires manipulating the stock market or predicting the stock market and getting rich from it. Uh, vampiric Wall Street bros getting rich from crypto. That, that's more interesting than vampires staying in high school. 
Edward didn't seem to understand why I objected to him spending money on me, why it made me uncomfortable if he took me to an expensive restaurant in Seattle, why he wasn't allowed to buy me a car that could reach speeds of over 55 miles an hour, or why I wouldn't let him pay for my co college tuition. He could be that way because he literally was born in a time where the, the men folk did that for the women folk. They kept them, kept whatever the term is, you know what I mean? However, dude, college is hella expensive. Just let the rich vampire pay for it. Consider it insurance against the fact that every moment you're with him, he could flip out, kill you and drain you of your blood. God, there's a paragraph explaining how Bella, Edward and Alice all sit on the same table as Bella's friends at lunchtime. And I cannot express to you how little I care about cafeteria feng shui. School ends, so they drive home. Your radio has horrible reception. I frowned. I didn't like it when you picked on my truck. The truck was great. It had personality. You want a nice stereo? Drive your own car. I was so nervous about Alice's plans on top of my already gloomy mood that the words came out sharper than I'd meant them. I was hardly ever bad tempered with Edward and my tone made him press his lips together to keep from smiling. I love when boys neg me and I love it when boys laugh at me when I get mad. It makes me feel really validated. <sighs> So then Edward breathes on Bella and she hyperventilates and then passes out and then she dies from vampiric induced asphyxiation, the end. No, but they kiss and then she tries to have a snog. Edward had drawn many careful lines for our physical relationship with the intent being on keeping me alive. Though I respected the need for maintaining a safe distance between my skin and his razor sharp venom coated teeth, I tended to forget about the trivial things like that when he was kissing me. They've never even touched tongues, have they? Bella would actually explode. God, no wonder she gets off of Jacob at the end of Eclipse. Also, why are all of his teeth venom coated? Did he not brush them in the morning? They go to Bella's to watch Romeo and Juliet. What's wrong with Romeo? I asked, a little offended. Romeo was one of my favorite fictional characters. Until I'd met Edward, I'd sort of had a thing for him. Well, first of all, he's in love with this Rosaline. Don't you think it makes him seem just a little fickle? And then a few minutes after their wedding, he kills Juliet's cousin. That's not very brilliant. Mistake after mistake. Could he have destroyed his own happiness any more thoroughly? Edward, you bellend, it's a book. Play, fiction, it's fiction. And it is almost as if Romeo is a ridiculous character. Almost as if it's satire. Also, what does she mean that she had a thing for Romeo? Has she been using Shakespeare for self-pleasure? Well, that is one way to show your appreciation for the arts. They get to the end where Romeo commits endgame and Edward is like, oh, humans have it so easy. Like, are, are you okay, bro? Do you want the number for my therapist, Edward? Is everything okay at home? Last spring when you were nearly killed, he paused to take a deep breath, struggling to return to his teasing tone. Of course I was trying to focus on finding you alive, but part of my mind was making contingency plans. Like I said, it's not as easy for me as it is for a human. That sounds entirely healthy and reasonable. Bella thinks about when James the Tracker tried to kill her. Watch my video for more details on that. And then Edward introduces the concept of the Volturi, the vampiric Italian family mafia, which again would be a better story than this. You must never, never, never think of anything like that again, I said. No matter what might ever happen to me, you're not allowed to hurt yourself. I'll never put you in danger again, so it's a moot point. Yeah, it's like a cow's opinion. It doesn't matter, it's just moo. But remember this part. Both of them are like, oh my God, no, you have to exist because you're so like important to me and dreamy and blah, 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 blah. I wish neither of them existed. Bella spits some facts. <laughs> it should be. I'm not really that interesting. And then Charlie comes home. They have pizza and then there's this weird aside. That's good. Hey, say hi to Alice for me. She hasn't been over in a while. Charlie's mouth pulled down at one quarter. What is that? She hasn't been over in a while. How'd you do that? Pulled down, right? Oh, where's Alice? <laughs> Sorry, I'm stupid. It's been three days, dad, I reminded him. Charlie was crazy about Alice. What, the vampire that looks like a child? Okay. He'd become attached last spring when he'd helped me through my awkward convalescence. Charlie would forever be grateful to her for saving him the horror of an almost adult daughter who needed help showering. I'll tell her. What am I genuinely meant to infer from this? Do I just see nonces everywhere in these books? Please let me know in the comments below. Bella and Edward drive to the Cullens mansion. He sighed, his lovely face serious. Bella, the last real birthday any of us had was Emmett in 1935. Cut us a little slack and don't be too difficult tonight. They're all very excited. 
It always startled me a little when he brought up things like that. Fine, I'll behave. It's Bella's birthday, not the Cullens, you weird codependent nightmares. Emmett and Rosalie will be there. Rosalie worries Bella because Bella is in love with Rosalie, but Rosalie hates her. Bella starts manipulating Edward by saying, ooh, maybe Alice will turn me into a vampire, he <laughs> And then Edward gets big mad at this. They were all waiting in the huge white living room when I walked through the door. They greeted me with a loud chorus of, happy birthday, Bella, while I blushed and looked down. Alice, I assumed, had covered every flat surface with pink candies. No, candles. <laughs> I'm hungry. And dozens of crystal bowls filled with hundreds of roses. There was a table with a white cloth draped over it next to Edward's grand piano, holding a pink birthday cake, more roses, a stack of glass plates, and a small pile of silver wrapped presents. It was a hundred times worse than I'd imagined. Bella, Alice went to a lot of trouble for you. That is just rude. <laughs> Rosalie and Emmett stood behind them. Rosalie didn't smile, but at least she didn't glare. Emmett's face was stretched into a huge grin. It'd been months since I'd seen them. I'd forgotten how gloriously beautiful Rosalie was. It almost hurt to look at her. See? Anyway, we have some foreshadowing. I tried not to be overly sensitive about it. Jasper had more trouble sticking to the Cullens diet than the rest of them. The scent of human blood was much harder for him to resist than the others. He hadn't been trying as long. He goes to a high school where there is going to be constant risk of human blood. Kids falling over, kids beating each other up, kids maybe getting a paper cut from like turning the pages of their textbooks. So this doesn't make any sense that he's allowed to go to a high school when he has this trouble. Jasper, Rosalie and Emmett give Bella a new stereo for her car. I'm assuming that Rosalie didn't actually help with the gift at all but just had her name scribbled on the card on account of her disliking Bella. Bella opens a gift from Alice. Shoot, I muttered when the paper sliced my finger. I pulled it out to examine the damage. A single drop of blood oozed from a tiny cut. Oh no, what could possibly go wrong? Jasper tries to do us a solid by violently attacking Bella to get to her blood, but unfortunately Emma and Edward stop him by um, throwing Bella into a glass table. Anyway, now she's bleeding even more and we end on a cliffhanger. Dazed and disoriented, I looked up from the bright red blood pulsing out my arm into the fevered eyes of the six suddenly ravenous vampires. Except we know that the others have more control over their bloodlust. I mean, like they helped her at the end of the last book when James like broke her leg or whatever. So this is far more dramatic than it actually is. It's trying to be more dramatic than it really is. Wait, 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 hold on a second. Stop the video because I have merch now. Yes, we've finally done it. I have merch, I have a merchandise store. We have four different designs and a range of products to choose from. This is the don't care, didn't ask. You know when someone just keeps going on and on and on about something you really don't care about? Well, hit them with one of these. My God, look at that coloring, the tasteful off-white thickness of it. Everything you see here is as eco-friendly as I could have made it. Items are recycled where possible, organic, sustainable, carbon neutral, the prints are all vegan. The supplier that I'm using even has a recycling scheme, so when your clothes get to the end of their life, you can send them back and then they can be remade and recycled into new things. Isn't that amazing? Not only that, but the clothes these factories are made in, in the UK, are powered by renewable energy. I know, I've outdone myself this time. <laughs> So let's get on to the designs. We have the don't care, didn't ask. We have it in the relaxed jumper. Here we have a jumper, which in Japanese says you may. In English, this means famous, as in, why am I not famous yet? We also have Elise in katakana on various items. And the piece de resistance is our die, cry, hate line, a parody of live, laugh, love. We have a puzzle made of recycled cardboard featuring die, cry, hate. For all the masochists out there who really enjoy really, really, really hard puzzles, look at all the white pieces, you'd be crazy to buy this one. Not only that, we have the tote bag to carry around all of your um, precious items in, and the tie-dye limited edition cry, die, hate t-shirt. So where can all this be found? I'm glad you asked. The website is AY Clothing, as in a, as in A Lameo, ayclothing.tmail.com. I'll put the links in the description. You can head over there if you would like to buy some merchandise to support the channel or just tell the world what you really think of them. Don't care, don't ask, die, cry, hate. I'm really excited to be putting this merchandise out to the world. It's just we've been working on this for a really, really long time and it's amazing to see it finally come to fruition. No, it's not true. 
don't trust any YouTuber when they tell you they've been working years on something. But this has been fun. I have wanted to do merchandise for a while, but I wanted something that wasn't going to be the usual kind of thing. I wanted it to stand separately on its own, as if it could be a brand of its own, maybe. We'll just see how it goes. But I also really wanted something to combat the live, laugh lovers of the world. So here we are, my demotivational merchandise line. If it goes well, then we will do a second drop in the future, but only if it goes well. So, you know, let me know if you guys want there to be a second drop. I'll know that by if I make any sales. And the artist I use for this project is my good friend, Jenny Pond. Her links will be in the description as well. So head over to ayclothing.tmail.com if you would like to buy some merchandise. Now, on with the video. Chapter two, stitches. Carlisle orders Jasper to be taken outside. Jasper struggled against Emmett's unbreakable grasp, twisting around, reaching toward his brother with his bared teeth, his eyes still past reason. If he's this volatile and full of bloodlust from a tiny little paper cut, how has it been safe to put him in a high school full of children who are gonna be getting into scrapes and bruises and cuts every day? All right, it's just convenient for the plot right now, I guess, I suppose. Rosalie is smug about this because nothing makes one superior by having their brother and species almost violently murder a sentient being that their other brother is dating. Maybe sentient is a bit of a stretch. Carlisle cleans up Bella's wounds and everyone else leaves to avoid the blood, but Carlisle doesn't mind the scent. Years and years of practice, he told me. I barely notice the scent anymore. Do you think it would be harder if you took a vacation from the hospital for a long time and weren't around any blood? Maybe, he shrugged his shoulders, but his hands remained steady. I've never felt the need for an extended holiday. He sma smashed, he smashed Bella right in the face. The end. He flashed a brilliant smile in my direction. I enjoyed my work too much. Christ, he's immortal and yet still working ceaselessly. What capitalist propaganda is this? Sorry, he apologized. That ought to do it. So I didn't agree with my father's particular brand of faith, but never in the nearly 400 years now since I was born have I ever seen anything to make me doubt whether God exists in some form or another. Not even the reflection in the mirror. Yeah, this definitely isn't the uh, opinion of the author shoehorned in. No, of course not. Carlisle admits that Edward believes that vampires lose their souls and so don't go on to any afterlife. And that's why he doesn't want to turn Bella because he doesn't want to steal her soul. Hard to steal something she doesn't have in the first place. Carlisle turned Edward because Edward's mother asked him to. Anyway, Edward comes back in and he's being really unemotional. Yes, Carlisle agreed. Tonight is exactly the kind of thing he fears the most, you being put in danger because of what we are. It's not his fault. It's not yours either. I looked away from his wise, beautiful eyes. I couldn't agree with that. Why is she always blaming herself? It's not her fault she's a human. It's very normal, in fact, what? Edward and Bella drive home. The silence was making me insane. Say something, I finally begged as he turned onto the freeway. What do you want me to say? He asked in a detached voice. He's so moody and annoying. She was the one that was attacked. She was the one that was in danger. He doesn't get to act like this. You're a nonce, stop it. Edward has a tantrum. Your fault, if you'd cut yourself at Mike Newton's house with Jessica there and Angela and your other normal friends. They, <laughs> Jessica's not a friend. The worst that could possibly have happened would be what? Maybe they couldn't find you a bandage? If you tripped and knocked over a pile of glass plates on your own without someone throwing you into them, even then what's the worst? You get blood on the seats and they drove you to the emergency room. Mike Newton could hold your hand while they stitched you up and he wouldn't be fighting the urge to kill you the whole time he was there. Don't try to take any of this on yourself, Bella. It'll only make me more disgusted with myself. And then Edward turns himself into a cuck. How the hell did Mike Newton end up in this conversation, I demanded. Mike Newton ends up in this conversation because Mike Newton would be a hell of a lot healthier for you to be with, he growled. I'd rather die than be of Mike Newton, I protested. I'd rather die than be of anyone but you. What a damning thing to say, poor Mike Newton. I would rather be dead than have to look at your miserable face for the rest of my life. <laughs> oh dear, death would be a release from this madness. Edward agrees to stay the night, so Bella goes in to see Charlie quickly. What happened to your arm? I flushed and cursed silently. I tripped, it's nothing. Bella, he sighed, shaking his head. Oh, that's Bella. Always lying about where she's getting her injuries from. Hmm, that's a red flag. But being around vampires is an occupational hazard. I had to take a break to go eat some crisps because I got fed up with this. Edward is in Bella's bed, being a depressed emo Nazi legend. Hi, he said. His voice was sad. He was wallowing. 
See, I never lie. Edward has presents for Bella, but he opens them for her just in case she accidentally cuts her head off or something. Carlyle and Esme have bought Bella tickets to go see her mum, plane tickets that is, and Edward's present is a CD. Ah, oh, he's burnt a CD for her. How 90s of him. He didn't say anything. He took the CD and reached around me to put it in the CD player on the bedside table. He hit play and we waited in silence. Then the music began. I listened, speechless and wide-eyed. I knew he was waiting for my reaction, but I couldn't talk. Tears welled up and I reached up to wipe them away before they could spill over. Oh God, it's all you two and Nickelback, isn't it? The CD contains Edward's compositions on piano for Bella. Bella's arm hurts, so Edward sneaks using his super speed to get her some Tylenol. It's so like useful to have a vampire around in, in really mundane ways. He won't catch me, Edward promised as he disappeared silently out the door and returned, catching the door before it had swung back to touch the frame. He had the glass from the bathroom, the bottle of pills in one hand. He's so fast, I can only imagine him as that squirrel from over the hedge. You know, when they give the squirrel the energy drink towards the end and then he like runs so fast that time slows down. Basically Edward. So they have a kiss and then Edward gets horny. The kiss began much the same as usual. Edward was as careful as ever and my heart began to overreact like it always did. And then something seemed to change. Suddenly his lips became much more urgent. His free hand twisted in my hair and held my face securely to his. And though my hands tangled in his hair too, and though I was clearly beginning to cross his cautious lines, for once he didn't stop me, his body was cold through the thin quilt but I crushed myself against him eagerly. Maybe they finally used tongues. So in the first book, Bella has these instances of almost premonition where she just knows things that realistically she shouldn't know. And she has another instance of it here. Fine, I agreed, snuggling closer to him. I really did feel exhausted. It had been a long day in so many ways, yet I felt no sense of relief at its end. Almost as if something worse was coming tomorrow. It was silly premonition. What could be worse than today? Just the shock catching up with me, no doubt. Bella realizes that the kiss is like the kiss Edward kissed her with before the James stuff happened, like when he thought that she was gonna die and he was never, never gonna see her again. So she thinks something bad's gonna happen. Anyway, the chapter ends with Bella going to sleep. Chapter three, the end. The chapter title, please don't threaten me of a good time, Maya. Edward is being aloof, so this gives Bella anxiety. Alice isn't at school. I swallowed, trying to dislodge the sudden lump in my throat. The guilt made my head bow and my shoulders slump. I'd run them out of their home, just like Rosalie and Emmett, I was a plague. I mean, you are a plague, but not for the reasons you'd think. By the end of the day, the silence was becoming ridiculous. I didn't want to be the one to break it, but apparently that was my only choice if I ever wanted him to talk to me again. See, I know that right now he's just stealing himself to leave her for her own good, right? Getting ready to do that. But he's being such a dramatic ass about it. Communicate, communication is key. Bella goes to work and actually hyperventilates, I'm not joking, over Edward being aloof of her. This is all very normal behavior from the both of them. Bella then cheers herself up by imagining her and Edward running away together. Yeah, good luck, sweetie. Bella goes home and Edward is there still being aloof and Bella has a reaction to this. I waited in the doorway. Finally, Edward looked over at me with a polite smile. I'll be right behind you, he promised. His eyes strayed back to the TV. I stared for another minute, shocked. Neither one seemed to notice. I could feel something, panic maybe, building up my chest. I escaped to the kitchen. Edward definitely knows the effect he's having on her. I mean, it's kind of obvious because she, she's always like this anyway. But he has super hearing. He can definitely hear her pulse going and her breathing and all of that. So he knows the effect that he's having on her. He needs to just put her out of her misery, take her around the back and old yell at her. Bella is seriously abandoning both parents who she claims to love to run away with Edward because she thinks that's gonna solve things. Bella takes a picture of her room because in her head, she has already decided that she and Edward are going to run away together for... I don't know, it's not really explained. She also hasn't informed Edward of this plan that she's made for their futures. Bella is a strange person. She gets pictures of Edward and Charlie, but Edward continues to be distant from her. Why did he even bother going to her house just act this cold? Edward dropped his hand from my shoulder and twisted casually out of my arm. He sat back down in the armchair. I hesitated and then went to sit against the sofa again. I was suddenly so frightened that my hands were shaking. I pressed them into my stomach to hide them, put my chin on my knees and stared at the TV screen in front of me, seeing nothing. All right, he won't communicate. Neither will she, but she is trying more than he is. He needs to grow the hell up for a centurion. Edward won't stay the night. Bella continues taking pictures of Forks, deluding herself into thinking that she and Edward are running away together. 
I guess because she's desperate, but that is quite the leap in logic, don't you think? Along with the fear, I was beginning to feel impatience. How long could this last? It lasted through the morning. He walked silently beside me, never seeming to actually look at me. Edward whispered the correct answer in it under his breath and then went back to ignoring me. At what point does this just turn into emotional abuse? A whole book ago? Bella gets through her day with Edward still giving her the silent treatment. Bella has her film developed in a few hours. I, I don't know. Then she goes on about how attractive Edward is. It's clearly not his personality she likes him for. Edward still hadn't come over. I didn't want to admit that he was the reason I stayed up so late, but of course he was. I tried to remember the last time he stayed away like this without an excuse, a phone call. He never had. Put her out of her misery. Edward is distant again the next day, but asks to meet Bella after school. A lot of stuff in the Twilight world that doesn't make any sense. Why are they still going to high school? <laughs> like up until last year, doesn't make <laughs> They're a hundred years old. After school, he suggests a walk. They go a bit into the woods, but not too far from the house. Edward says the Cullens are leaving because they look too young. His answer confused me. I thought the point of leaving was to let his family live in peace. Why did we have to leave if they were going? I stared at him, trying to understand what he meant. He stared back coldly. With a roll of nausea, I realised I'd misunderstood. So from his point of view, he thinks that they can't be together because she will end up hurt or dead, which is true, but he supposedly loves her, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what these books are about, uh, the vampire loving the little lamb, precious little lamb chop girl. <laughs> But he is such a douchebag, like unnecessarily a douchebag in this whole scene. I don't believe him. Go away, leave already, see you later. Adios, sayonara, bitch. As long as that was best for you, he interrupted to correct me. No, this is about my soul, isn't it? I shouted, furious, the words exploding out of me. Somehow it still sounded like a plea. Carlyle told me about that, and I don't care, Edward, I don't care. You can have my soul. I don't want it without you, it's yours already. <laughs> I'm gonna take an acting course, why not? Babes, you've been together for like six months, yeah? You can find another supernatural being, I promise you. Also, your eternal soul, some guy you've been with six months. Okay. It's, I find it's funny that people think it's romantic. I just I never really got it. Edward plays his final card to try to get through to Bella by lying through his teeth. Bella, I don't want you to come with me. He spoke the words slowly and precisely, his cold eyes on my face, watching as I absorbed what he was really saying. There was a pause as I repeated the words in my head a few times, sifting through them for their real intent. You don't want me? I tried out the words, confused by the way they sounded, placed in that order. No. <laughs> then he pours salt into the wound. He looked away into the trees as he spoke again. Of course, I'll always love you. In a way. But what happened the other night made me realise that it's time for a change. Because I'm tired of pretending to be something I'm not. I'm just laughing at my Oscar-worthy performance. I'm really giving it something here. I feel like Anna Lynn McCord doing a poem to Putin. Bella. I am not human. And then he blames her. You're not good for me, Bella. He turned his earlier words around as so I had no argument. How well I knew that I wasn't good enough for him. I do know at the end of the novel, his justification for being such a massive bell is that he thinks it will help her get over him quicker if he's mean, but I don't believe this. Her self-worth, value, esteem is so small that she wants to give away her soul to a dude she's been dating for six months. He must have on some level known that she would take these words to heart and blame herself. He is toxic. He then tells her not to do anything stupid because we love it when a man bosses us around whilst he's dumping us. His eyes cooled, the distance returned. I'm thinking of Charlie, of course. He needs you. Take care of yourself for him. Yes, yes, of course, take care of yourself for another man. Thank you, Stephanie Mayer, very cool. And I'll make you a promise in return, he said. I promise that this will be the last time you'll see me. I won't come back. I won't put you through anything like this again. You can go on with your life without any more interference from me. It will be as if I'd never existed. The absolute drama, he is so dramatic. He smiled gently. Don't worry, you're human. Your memory is no more than a sieve. Time heals all wounds for your kind. Love being patronised when I'm being dumped, babes. He then has the absolute audacity to imply that he's going to be swarming with vampiric pussy. And your memories? I asked. It sounded like there was something stuck in my throat, like I was choking. 
Well, he hesitated for a short second. I won't forget, but my kind? We're very easily distracted. He smiled. The smile was tranquil and it did not touch his eyes. Seriously, how would you take this as if, a, if a dude said this to you when they were dumping you, hmm? He took a step away from me. That's everything, I suppose. We won't bother you again. He's being so flippant about this, but I do also know that at the end of the book, he's all like, oh, babes, it tore me apart. I love you so much. Block him. Alice is gone. My voice was blank with disbelief. She wanted to say goodbye, but I convinced her that a clean break would be better for you. Well, that's controlling. Edward kisses her forehead. Talk about mixed flipping signals. And then he's, he disappears. Unfortunately, not forever. Remember what Edward said about wanting to make sure that Bella was safe and would never, ever, ever come to harm? Well, shell-shocked from being dumped, she proceeds to walk around the woods for hours trying to find Edward. She trips over something and then stays on the forest floor by herself at night time in a flipping forest that sometimes has bears or wolves. And Edward just left her like this. Yeah, I believe that you love her, mate. Thousands wouldn't. Not tonight. Tonight the sky was utterly black. Perhaps there was no moon tonight. A lunar eclipse. A new moon. A new moon. I shivered, though I wasn't cold. Ah, <laughs> oh, beautiful, stunning and brave. Bella is dazed, so she lies on the floor, ignoring distant shouts of her name. It's raining, the calling begins again, and she's so traumatized by Edward's dumping that she can't respond, even though she remembers that she should respond. Suddenly, there was another sound, startlingly close. A kind of snuffling, an animal sound. It sounded big. Say sound one more time. I wondered if I should feel afraid. I didn't. Just numb. It didn't matter. The snuffling went away. One of the werewolves find her, but we're not supposed to know this yet and just assume that a bear almost ate her, but then thought better of the stomachache it would cause him. Someone, the werewolf, tries to speak to her. The werewolf's name is Sam Yuli. I knew the words meant something, but I could only stare, bewildered. How could the meaning matter at this point? Charlie? That struck a chord. I tried to pay more attention to what he was saying. Charlie mattered, if nothing else did. This is so dramatic, but look how fragile Bella is. And Edward, knowing that she's just this fragile little creature, dumped her in a forest and didn't secretly look back to make sure that she was okay. Not even once. Awful person. Would Alice have not had a vision about Bella wandering around in the... Well, when there's werewolves, it kind of blocks Alice's vision, but she should have seen Bella wandering around the woods by herself for hours alone and then told Edward, surely. A family of idiots. Sam picks her up and takes her home. No, I don't think she's hurt, he told someone. She just keeps saying he's gone. Was I saying that out loud? I bit down on my lip. She's so dramatic. How could Edward dump her? She's like an episode of EastEnders. It's endlessly entertaining. Charlie carries Bella home as she joins the Black Parade. There were lights everywhere, held by the crowd walking with him. It felt like a parade or a funeral procession. I closed my eyes. I hated the makeup I had on yesterday. It was the foundation, it was so thick. So I don't wear foundation anymore. Hmm. I don't know why I'm being smug about that. Because the bar is so low. But I'm gonna try and get all of this done in one go. With God as my witness, I'm going to do this. It's currently 20 to 11. I'm debating whether to get a Coca-Cola from McDonald's so I can stay up. I don't know why McDonald's Coke just hits differently. No, if needs be, I'll make a hot chocolate. I can't drink coffee at this time of night. It'll make me go nuts. So let's get on with it. A doctor looks at Bella. Bella is basically almost catatonic after being dumped, but she's still cognizant enough to notice this tiny difference in inference. It took me a minute to think that through. I was confused by the memory of Sam Yuli's similar question in the woods. Only Sam had asked something else. Have you been hurt? He'd said. The difference seemed significant somehow. Miss Mayer, please stop making Bella so incredibly aware, noticing all these little differences, when literally the whole last chapter, she deluded herself into thinking that her and Edward were just gonna run away to a desert island together and see off eternity drinking from coconut shells on a beach. Most of the time we're helping with the search, so now a bunch of them are in the house whilst Bella is being asked questions by the doctor. Mike is there as well, Mike Newton, and I think his parents are there, which seems a bit intrusive, really, to have the whole neighbourhood inside your house to come and watch uh, after you've been in shock and you got lost in the woods. Charlie knows what's up, though, because Carlisle has left the hospital, stating he had a new offer somewhere else that he wanted to take. 
I'm sorry, but the whole family just upped and left their lives because Edward had a tantrum. Alice didn't even get to say goodbye to Bella and they're meant to be close friends. We're told that they're close friends, but she can't even say goodbye to her. Edward is pathetic, an asshole. Uh, his family are pushovers and he's, he's just a spoiled brat. Like it's very spoiled behavior, isn't it? Also, don't most jobs require you to hand in a notice period unless he was some sort of freelancer, but he's a really good doctor and he's been there for a few years. So I'd assume he'd need at least like two weeks notice. Just very convenient, isn't it? Is that another vampiric power being able to drop jobs and not get sued for not seeing your notice period? Bella dozes whilst Charlie rings round to tell everyone that she's been found. He gets another phone call that the guys at the reservation in La Push are burning fires on the sea cliffs. So he rings Billy and he finds out that the guys are celebrating that the vampires are now gone. You know, the werewolf guys. Bella, Charlie asked. I looked at him uneasily. He left you alone in the woods, Charlie guessed. Your note, Charlie answered, surprised. He reached into the back pocket of his jeans and pulled out a much abused piece of paper. It was dirty and damp with multiple creases from being opened and refolded many times. He unfolded it again and held it up as evidence. The messy handwriting was remarkably close to my own. Going for a walk with Edward up the path, it said. Back soon, B. Oh, sure. Edward thinks of everything except for maybe to check back on Bella once to make sure that she's not been picked off by a bear or a werewolf. That the Cullens know about as well. They know that werewolves exist in Lepush. They have a treaty with them. They also like are racist to the werewolves and think that they're also emotional and they can't control themselves and that they're really dangerous. So you'd think Edward would have checked on Bella to make sure she hadn't accidentally been torn apart by a werewolf. Charlie says that Carlisle took a big job in LA and we know that that's not true because the vampires would be caught out sparkling if they were in LA. I mean, sparkling doesn't exactly connote that one is a vampire anyway. So maybe they could get away with living in LA if they just pretended to all be method actors who are really into glittering. I want to know if Edward left you out there alone in the middle of the woods, Charlie insisted. His name sent another wave of torture through me. I shook my head, frantic, desperate to escape the pain. It was my fault. He left me right there on the trail in sight of the house, but I tried to follow him. Still trying to defend him after he dumped her in a woods. This is pathetic. It's like a huge hole has been punched through my chest. True love does not mean the absence of having a backbone. Bella runs to her room to find that the CD that Edward made her is gone and so is the photo of him in her photo album because he is a flipping psychopath. Who does that? Some people keep mementos of their past relationships but he's denying, like he is denying her. That he's so rude, I hate him so much. Like who does that? Can't just be like, oh, I'm just gonna take this thing that I've made you so you'll forget about. So weird and dramatic. Like he had to go through her possessions and get rid of this. He's so weird. How is this the ultimate dreamy boy? How is this the ultimate manic pixie dream boy? So gross. Bella drowns, metaphorically, unfortunately. Then we get some absolute wastes of paper as the months go by blank. Imagine being a tree and living for hundreds of years and then being chopped down, right? And made into paper and you're made into twilight. But worse than that, you're made into the blank pages that literally just say the month. Like those trees might have had dreams of being turned into porn. But here we are. Chapter four, waking up. We are in February. It has been five months since the dumping in the woods. Bella describes what it's like for me to script these videos. Time passes, even when it seems impossible, even when each tick of the second hand aches like the pulse of blood behind a bruise. It passes unevenly in strange lurches and dragging lulls, but pass it does, even for me. If this was in a different context and wasn't about Bella just being dumped by her stupid glittery boyfriend, I wouldn't actually mind that. Like, I think it's all right. I just think it's so bloody dramatic when it's in the context of Twilight. Bella has turned into a robot and Charlie is sick of it. So he wants to send her back to Jacksonville. Charlie was scowling. You didn't do anything. That's the problem. You never do anything. Roasted. At this point in the script, I felt relatively at ease. Almost good about doing this. You know, it, one of my favorite pastimes is making fun of, of things that I deem pretty bad but I kind of like the fact that they're bad because I get to make fun of them because I, I just like to do that. I think 
I felt good because after having to deal with Fifty Shades of Grey, this felt fine in comparison. However, I don't think that's a positive though, that Fifty Shades of Grey had to bludgeon my brain for me to feel fine whilst reading Twilight. This is not a win for Maya. I think I've just given up with life, given up with hope. You want me to get into trouble? I wondered, my eyebrows pulling together in mystification. I made an effort to pay attention. It wasn't easy. I was so used to tuning everything out, my ears felt stopped up. Edward's dumping really did a number on her. Charlie calls her lifeless. Boom, roasted. I'm sorry, Dad. My apology sounded a little flat, even to me. I thought I'd been fooling him. Keeping Charlie from suffering was the whole point of all this effort. How depressing to think that the effort had been wasted. The forced martyrdom is very annoying and insincere. Charlie wants Bella to see a shrink and she's resistant about it because she can't be honest about the vampires and supernatural beings and whatnot. Also, she might learn to get some self-esteem and then she wouldn't want Edward back at the end of this book and that would be at the end of Twilight as we know it. Charlie thinks Bella will be better off outside of Forks, but she makes excuses to stay. His fist came down on the table again. We both know what's really going on here, Bella, and it's not good for you. He took a deep breath. It's been months. No calls, no letters, no contact. You can't keep waiting for him. Charlie is a straight savage, but he's so right. This whole subject was utterly forbidden as he was well aware. Right, no wonder she can't get over it. She has tried to repress his existence entirely. Unhealthy, like you're never gonna get over it then, are you? Bella storms off and um, does calculus in her car before school. Bella reveals herself to be a true comrade. I didn't mind communism. She gets to class. How the flip am I 99 pages into this? And all that's happened is Edward dumped her. 99 pages. Mike Newton is anxious when speaking to her. He didn't bother walking me to class anymore. Why should he? He's not your dog. It had been weeks, maybe months, since Jess even greeted me when I passed her in the hall. I knew I had offended her at my antisocial behaviour and she was sulking. It wasn't going to be easy to talk to her now. Right, basically Bella withdrew from all of her friends completely. And look at the language here too. Bella is allowed to turn into a robot because her uh, boyfriend dumped her, but Jessica not wanting to engage with her after repeatedly trying initially is sulking behaviour. It's just one rule for me, another for thee. I wasn't about to face Charlie again without some kind of social interaction to report. I knew I couldn't lie, though the thought of driving to poor Angela's and <laughs> Angela, I sound like Matt Berry, Matt Berry. The thought of poor Angela's father. Sorry, you and he were buddies, weren't you? Let's see if you got that reference in the comment section below. And back alone. Being sure my odour meter of that. It's like a Geiger counter, but for her odour. So I'm stupid, I'm sorry. Reflected the correct mileage, just in case he checked, was very tempting. That is really like next level paranoid weird behaviour. Jess, my nose wrinkled as I cringed, waiting for her to turn on me. Great, so you've not spoken to your friend for like five months. Not that her and Jess probably weren't real friends in the first place anyway. We haven't spoken to this person for a long time. And the face you're making, Jess? Like, oh, she's gonna think you're normal now, isn't she? She twisted in her seat to face me, eyeing me incredulously. Are you talking to me, Bella? Of course. I widened my eyes to suggest innocence. What? Do you need help with calculus? Her tone was a tad sour. I think Maya's intent with this is that we're supposed to think, oh, Jess, what a biatch. But I've read Twilight. Nothing happens. Uh, so I know that Bella really doesn't think shit of all of her human friends, especially Jess. So yes, no wonder Jess is suspicious that Bella talking to her after completely shutting everyone out for five months is realistic. No, I shook my head. Actually, I wanted to know if you would go to the movies with me tonight. I really need a girls night out. The words sound as stiff. Ugh, movies, Coca-Cola. That hits differently too. It's like McDonald's Coke. Not enough time. Ugh, they should sponsor me and send me freebies. The words sounded stiff, like badly delivered lines. All of Bella's words sound stiff, like badly delivered lines. And she looked suspicious. Why are you asking me? She asked, still unfriendly. The assumption here is that when Bella says jump, Jeff's obviously should say how high, like all the other boys do. You're the first person I think of when I want girl time, I smiled, and I hope the smile looked genuine. It was probably true. What does that mean? 
you, you should know if it's true or not. She was at least the first person I thought of when I wanted to avoid Charlie. It amounted to the same thing. Right, she's just using Jess to get Charlie off of her back so she can stay in Forks and mope around waiting for Edward to return. Boo. That is this book. This is not an interesting concept for a book. The main character just moping around. This is what she does for about 500 pages. They decide on watching a zombie film. Okay, she seemed surprised by my response. I tried to remember if I liked scary movies, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, completely losing all sense of identity, likes, dislikes, after being dumped by a boy you've known for less than a year. It's very normal behavior. I should stop calling him a boy because he's a man. An old man, an old granddad. <laughs> very normal. I knew from experience that once I got Jessica talking, I'd be able to get away with a few mumbled responses at the appropriate moments. Only minimal interaction would be required. She's such a good friend. The thick haze that blurred my days now was sometimes confusing. I was surprised when I found myself in my room, not clearly remembering the drive home from school or even opening the front door. That's dangerous, but that didn't matter. Losing track of time was the most I asked from life. Maya writes Bella's heartbreak as if she's sustained long-term brain damage and it's, it's just confusing. My eyes did not stray toward the black garbage bag that held my present from that last birthday. Did not see the shape of the stereo where it strained against the black plastic. I didn't think of the bloody mess my nails had been when I'd finished clawing it out of the dashboard. Oh dear. Also, chuck it away. What are you doing? I glanced at myself in the hall mirror before I opened the door, arranging my features carefully into a smile and trying to hold them there. It's like if an alien was trying to mimic human behavior. Jess and Bella drive to the cinema. Bella puts on rap. Jess is surprised at this. They talk about Jess's social life. At the cinema, there's a young couple in the zombie movie and this triggers Bella. The existence of couples triggers Bella. Like literally, she runs away to get popcorn because she has a little freak out. When she goes back, she realizes that she is like the zombie in the film and this unnerves her. However, on the bright side, maybe now she will be supernatural enough for Edward to come back and date her. If you can call that a bright side, I wouldn't. It was depressing to realize that I wasn't the heroine anymore, that my story, was over. You're 18. Go to college. Go away. Jess is irritated because Bella keeps acting like a freak. Where do you want to eat? Jess asked. I don't care. Okay. Okay. She and Jess walk together, but Jess gets unnerved by some men hanging outside a bar. Bella gets deja vu from that time she was in town and almost got attacked by a gang of men. Chill out, chill out, chill out, chill out. Med thing in Brixton. And so she decides to walk up to these men for a chat. Are you crazy? She whispered. Are you suicidal? That question caught my attention and my eyes focused on her. No, I'm not. My voice sounded defensive, but it was true. I wasn't suicidal. Even in the beginning when death unquestionably would have been a relief. I didn't consider it. I owed too much to Charlie. I felt too responsible for Renee. I had to think of them. Yeah, that's right. No suicidal ideation in my Christian vampire story. Bella, stop this right now. My muscles locked into place froze me where I stood because it wasn't Jessica's voice that rebuked me now. It was a furious voice, a familiar voice, a beautiful voice, soft like velvet, even though it was irate. Bella actually hallucinates Edward's voice. I don't know what to say other than go to a doctor. Go back to Jessica, the lovely voice ordered, still angry. You promised, nothing stupid. Even as a disembodied auditory hallucination, he is still bossing her around. Then there's a hell of a lot of internal dialogue for someone who is approaching some strangers too much for a few seconds worth of action. Very few seconds had passed while I sorted this all out. See? One of the men says hello to her. Now that I was closer and my eyes felt oddly unfocused, I analysed the short, dark man's face. It was not familiar in any way. I suffered a curious sensation of disappointment that this was not the terrible man who had tried to hurt me almost a year ago. The men before were going to attempt to... gang her. So Bella's sensation of disappointment is dramatic, naive, and beyond stupid. I don't actually know how Maya got away with writing this trash. Now that there's no threat, Bella loses interest because the head voice Edward won't admonish her. Jess is mad at Bella for risking her safety and Bella is oblivious to this. I tried to start a conversation a few times while we ate, but Jessica was not cooperative. I must have really offended her. The way Maya writes the character of Jess is like Bella is always placing the blame on Jess's reactions to Bella's stupid behavior. As much as I struggled not to think of him, I did not struggle to forget. 
I worried late in the night when the exhaustion of sleep deprivation broke down my defences that it was all slipping away, that my mind was a sieve and I would someday not be able to remember the precise colour of oh, it's all right, it's so dreamy. But Bella internalised Edward's negging about her brain being like a sieve. Because there was just one thing that I had to believe to be able to live. I had to know that he existed. That was all. Everything else I could endure, so long as he existed. She has zero life and she's fine with that just as long as she can remember that Edward existed. It's so baffling. They weren't lovers for 90 years or even hundreds of years or even, even 10 years. They dated for six months. She's 18. I've had enough. Don't teach young teens this nonsense. Thanks for going out with me, Jess, I said as I opened my door. That was fun. I hope that fun was the appropriate word. Sure, she muttered. I'm sorry about after the movie. Whatever, Bella. Whatever, Bella, McDonald's worker. Let me know in the conversation below if you got that reference. What is that? Where did that come from? Why was British culture for ages like whatever McDonald's were? Why? She glared out the windshield instead of looking at me. She seemed to be growing angrier rather than getting over it. I'd forgotten her by the time I was inside. Bella is a terrible, terrible friend. <coughs> My dishwasher's making funny noises, ignore it. Bella goes to bed and it's full of pain. Honestly, same at reading this. It was a crippling thing, this sensation that a huge hole had been punched through my chest, excising my most vital organs and leaving ragged, unhealed gashes around the edges that continued to throb and bleed despite the passage of time. Rationally, I knew my lungs must still be intact, yet I gasped for air and my head spun like my efforts yielded me nothing. My heart must have been beating too, but I couldn't hear the sound of my pulse in my ears. My hands felt blue of cold. I curled inward, hugging my ribs to hold myself together. I scrambled for my numbness, shush, my denial, but it evaded me. What? Anyway, she goes to bed, next chapter. Chapter five, Cheetah. Bella is at work. She isn't as numb as she was before because she heard Edward's voice and it sort of woken her up in a sense. Some hikers are talking about these huge bears that they've seen on a trail. Bears that are just it, clearly werewolves, but okay. On all fours, it was taller than you, the bearded man insisted while I gathered my things together. Big as a house and pitch black. I'm going to report it to the ranger here. People ought to be warned. This wasn't up on the mountain, mind you. This was only a few miles from the trailhead. Well, in England, houses generally look like this. So when someone says as big as a house, that's what springs to mind for me. Even if it was a one story house, that's massive. How is a wolf? That's, how is it that size? There's no way. Bella tells us that she has nightmares every single night where she's always searching for something in the dreary woods. Like that, that's it, that's the whole nightmare, just searching for something. It sounds terrifying, mate. You should meet my sleep paralysis demon when he knocks about. She feels like there's this big hole within her because without Edward, she is a shell of a person. I thumbed my head against the steering wheel, trying to distract myself from the sharper pain. Am I just cold and dead inside? Yes, but hear me out. I have certainly acted crazy over boys. Can you believe it? I've acted crazy over boys. You know, when I was younger and emotionally irrational and very reactive and immature and I've been like silly as well you know back when I had emotions I've been upset for the, over the demise of long relationships at least for like a day I'm joking a week or two <laughs> I told you I'm dead inside but I've never been this volatile and empty and felt like there was a big hole within me because of someone else for five months is it just me am I the one that's just mean let me know in the comments below. Bella decides to become reckless. That was fun. Uh, yeah. So, so she can hear Edward's voice. And it's not like maybe they were together for six months and it ended tragically. One of them passed away like too, well, Edward's about a hundred, so it wouldn't be too early for his time. But you know, before the prime of their life, that kind of thing. He literally dumped her in a woods and made his family ghost her, made her supposed close friend Alice also ghost her. They went along with it. Why didn't Alice foresee this happening too? If if her visions are so good that she can see the presents Bella is going to get from her parents and also uh, predict the stock market, how could she not predict that a paper cut was going to happen? Plot hole after plot hole. Dumped her unceremoniously in a woods. Didn't bother to check back on her while she like 
tripped herself up almost to death. This is not someone that you should be having a big hole within you about. This is a narcissistic git. So she decides to become reckless so she can hear Edward's voice again. Upon coming to this decision, she sees some old motorbikes for sale and decides it's fate. Then there's this bit where she says that Charlie had told her all about the motorbike accidents that he's seen as a cop and how he made her promise to never ride a bike. Bearing in mind, she's just told us that she would never think of committing because it could hurt Charlie, but somehow potentially killing herself on a motorbike is fine. One of the Marx boys opened the door, the younger one, the freshman. I couldn't remember his name. His sandy hair only came up to my shoulder. He had no trouble remembering my name. Bella Swan, he asked in surprise. Why would he know? Ugh, go away. The boy gives them to her for free because they are broken. The bikes, not Bella. And then Bella remembers that Jacob Black exists, so she takes the bikes to him to be fixed. Jacob has grown up or something. Hey Jacob, I felt an unfamiliar surge of enthusiasm at his smile. I realised that I was pleased to see him. This knowledge surprised me. I smiled back and something clicked silently into place like two corresponding puzzle pieces. I'd forgotten how much I really liked Jacob Black. She is such a robot cretin, get out. Jacob is six foot five now. He's literally Jeff Goldblum height. Jeff Goldblum should have played him in the films. Jacob is working on an old car and Bella tells him of the bikes and Jacob offers to work on them for free but Bella gifts him one of them so they can have lessons together. Wait a sec, are you legal yet? When's your birthday? Weird sentence out of context. You missed it, he teased, narrowing his eyes in mock resentment. I'm 16. Not that your age ever stopped you before, I muttered. Sorry about your birthday. Don't worry about it, I missed yours. What are you, 40? Christ, don't make her more insecure about being the geriatric age of 18. We'll have a joint party to make up for it. Sounds like a date. His eyes sparkled at the word. I needed to rein in the enthusiasm before I gave him the wrong idea. It was just that it had been a long time since I'd felt so light and buoyant. The rarity of the feeling made it more difficult to manage. She is very aware that he has a crush on her and there are several instances throughout this book where she uses this to her advantage. This book is basically her leading him on for hundreds of pages. and I'm totally right about this. So don't even try and argue with me. I will just show you throughout this movie of a video. I've got some money saved, college funds, you know. College smollage, I thought to myself. It wasn't like I'd saved up enough to go anywhere special. And besides, I had no desire to flee forks anyway. What difference would it make if I skimmed a little bit off the top? Yeah, to pay for the parts for the bikes, she's dipping into her college fund. <laughs> he didn't see anything wrong with that picture. Jacob was a gift from the gods. There are also moments littered throughout this book where Bella has this strange over the top reverence for Jacob. It inappropriately blurs the lines of friendship between them. It's a bit dysfunctional. Actually, no, it's totally dysfunctional. It's a codependent mess. Chapter six, friends. Jacob starts working on the bikes and two of his friends, Quill and Embry, show up. Quill, Embry, this is my friend Bella. Quill and Embry, I still didn't know which was which, exchanged a loaded look. All I wrote here was, I don't know, I'm sure there's a joke here somewhere. Think of it in the edit. No, there really isn't. Maybe I was delirious. The boys are excited about the bikes. I figured I'd have to have a Y chromosome to really understand the excitement. Shut up, Bella. And by extension, Maya. Bella decides she's enjoyed herself for once in her miserable existence, but it's time to leave to go home to cook dinner for Charlie like the good little house daughter she is. Jake, if I took these to a mechanic, how much would he charge me? I pointed out. Okay, you're getting a deal. Not to mention the riding lessons, I added. Quill grinned widely at Embry and whispered something I didn't catch. Jacob's hand flashed out to smack the back of Quill's head. That's it, get out, he muttered. Did, did Mayo just make a sex joke? In my Christian novel? Maybe there's hope for her yet. I giggled quietly. The sound made my eyes widen in wonder. I was laughing, actually laughing, and there wasn't anyone watching. I felt so weightless that I laughed again, just to make the feeling last longer. Now the obsession with Jacob Black has begun. Bella has codependency issues up the wazoo. I wasn't numb anymore. Tonight would, no doubt, be as horrific as last night. I lay down on my bed and curled into a ball in preparation for the onslaught. I squeezed my eyes shut and the next thing I knew, it was morning. I stared at the pale silver light coming through my window, stunned. Bella goes to Jacob's. Outside, the rain came down like water slopped from a bucket. I had to drive more slowly than I wanted to. I could hardly see a car length in front of the truck, but I finally made it through the muddy lanes to Jacob's house. Before I'd killed the engine, the front door opened and Jacob came running out with a huge black umbrella. He held it at my door while I opened it. Charlie called, said you were on your way, Jacob explained with a grin. 
Simp. Jacob worries about how much it's going to cost to get the bikes running. I pulled my checkbook out, fanned myself with it and rolled my eyes at his worries. We're covered. Tory. But Bella is much more playful with Jacob than she ever, ever is with Edward already, like a day into their friendship. I suppose it helps when you don't have to be consciously aware of the fact that your boyfriend could accidentally kill you at any given moment. They hang out all day and... I'm doing all the talking, he complained, after a long story about Quill and the trouble he stirred up by asking out a senior steady girlfriend. Why don't you take a turn? What's going on in Forks? It has to be more interesting than the push. Wrong, I sighed. There's really nothing. Your friends are a lot more interesting than mine. I like your friends. Quill's funny. He frowned. I think Quill, like, like, you don't have any friends, so how would you know that his friends are more interesting than you? <laughs> Maybe you'd be more aware if you actually took an active interest in your friends' lives. Quill's funny. He frowned. I think Quill likes you. I laughed. He's a little young for me. Jacob's frown deepened. He's not that much younger than you. It's just a year and a few months. I had a feeling we weren't talking about Quill anymore. I kept my voice light, teasing. Sure, but considering the difference in maturity between guys and girls, don't you have to count that in dog years? And what does that make me, about 12 years older? He laughed, rolling his eyes. Okay, but if you're going to get picky like that, you have to average in size too. You're so small and kawaii. Mmm, so small. Hmm. <laughs> You're so small, I'll have to knock 10 years off your total. Five foot four is perfectly average, I sniffed. It's not my fault you're a freak. Hmm. By the time we got back to La Push, I was 23 and he was 30. He was definitely weighting skills in his favour. Yeah, and by the time I finish this video, I'll be 100. Jacob works on the bikes, but Charlie comes round, so Jacob grabs Bella's hand to take her out of the garage. Charlie stared at me with wide eyes that flashed down to note Jacob's hands around mine. I have a suspicion that I'm in the small minority that believes Bella completely leads Jacob on in this book. This does not apply to Eclipse when Jacob uses his supernatural strength to assault her with a kiss that she can't fight off no matter what she does. It's just assault. But before that, in this book, Jacob clearly fancies her and she doesn't really even try to establish boundaries with him. She says several times about how, oh, she can like him in that way. But then she's always like cuddling with him and holding his hand and stuff. And we'll get into it as it goes along. But she gets obsessive with him in this book purely because he distracts her from moping around about Edward. She uses his existence for comfort, basically. Charlie and Billy's friend, Harry Clearwater, is around with his wife and two kids, Leah and Seth. They all eat spaghetti. Charlie made fishing plans. Sue teased her husband about his cholesterol and tried, unsuccessfully, to shame him into eating something green and leafly. I was actually impressed by this because Harry, spoiler alert, later on in the book, dies of a heart attack. Stephanie Mayer convincingly foreshadowed something. Well, I never. They all go home after a nice evening together and Bella reads an email from her mother. She wrote about her day, a new book club that filled the time slot of the meditation classes she'd just quit. Her week subbing in the second grade, missing her kindergartners. She wrote that Phil was enjoying his new coaching job and that they were planning a second honeymoon trip to Disney World. I noticed that the whole thing read like a journal entry rather than a letter to someone else. Remorse flooded through me, leaving an uncomfortable sting behind. Some daughter I was. Bella Swan is a shit daughter. <laughs> In the fourth book, she was so ready and prepared to never speak to her parents again and pretend that she had died of like some illness. Stoned. To hide away like her vampirism from them. She doesn't care about her parents. What's going on? Where's all the lamb? You're no, all out of no, lamb? No more, no more. What do you mean no more lamb? And we're told several times throughout the books that she does and she has a good relationship with her parents, but she really doesn't. As soon as the Cullens come along, she's like, ugh, Renee and Charlie who? Bella goes to sleep and has a nightmare that Sam Yulee stares at her in a forest. This is terrifying stuff, I know. I hope you can all sleep at night after I tell you this. Bella goes to school and realises that no one cares about her existence anymore. A la mayo. Jessica didn't look up when I sat down next to her in calculus. Hey Jess, I said with put on nonchalance. How was the rest of your weekend? She looked at me with suspicious eyes. Could she still be angry or was she just too impatient to deal with a crazy person? Super, she said, turning back to her book. That's good, I mumbled. The figure of speech cold shoulder seemed to have some literal truth to it. I could feel the warm air blowing from the floor vents, but I was still too cold. I took the jacket off the back of my chair and put it on again. What do you expect after acting like a nutcase? She goes to lunch. 
I barely recognised Lauren. She cut off all her blonde corn silk hair. Now she had a pixie cut so short that the back was shaved like a boy. What an odd thing for her to do. I wish I knew the reason behind it. Maybe she just like wants to. Did she get gum stuck in it? Did she sell it? Had all the people she was habitually nasty to caught her from behind the gym and scalped her? I decided it wasn't fair for me to judge her now by my former opinion. For all I knew, she turned into a nice person. You're not a nice person. Ben's got the stomach flu, Angela said in a quiet, calm voice. Hopefully it's just some 24 hour thing. He was really sick last night. Angela had changed her hair too. She'd grown out her layers. Bella is so self-absorbed. She didn't notice that someone really like cut their hair from here to here. Angela tells the group that she thinks she saw a big bear in the woods. Lauren snorted. Oh, not you two. Her eyes turned mocking and I decided that I didn't need to give her the benefit of the doubt. Obviously her personality had not changed as much as her hair. Tyler tried to sell me that one last week. Bella, you are hardly the king of good personalities, so zip it. No one believes Angela about the bear. No, she's right, I threw in impatiently. We had a hiker in Just Saturday who saw the bear too, Angela. He said it was huge and black and just outside of town, didn't he, Mike? There was a moment of silence. Every pair of eyes at the table turned to stare at me in shock. The new girl, Katie, had her mouth hanging open like she'd just witnessed an explosion. Nobody moved. Everyone is amazed that Bella deigns to speak to them again. Mike then spends his lunchtime grilling Bella. I suppose his obsession is back in full force now. She looked at me with concern, but not the offensive maybe she's lost it kind. Are you okay? This is why I'd pick Jessica over Angela. I'd always liked Angela more for the girls' movie night. Angela was too perceptive. Not completely, I admitted, but I'm a little better. I'm glad, she said. I've missed you. There was literally nothing there to miss in the first place. Chapter 7. Repetition. What a apt title. I wasn't sure what the hell I was doing here. Was I trying to push myself back into the zombie stupor? Had I turned masochistic, developed a taste for torture? I should have gone straight down to La Push. I felt much, much healthier around Jacob. This was not a healthy thing to do. Mm, yeah, new codependency to replace the previous one just screams health and wealth and gorgeous, gorgeous girl to me. Bella is driving towards the Cullen's abandoned house to try to hear Edward's voice again and to prove that he even existed in the first place. I turned my back on the gaping emptiness and hurried to my truck. I nearly ran. I was anxious to be gone to get back to the human world. I felt hideously empty and I wanted to see Jacob. Maybe I was developing a new kind of sickness, another addiction like the numbness before. I didn't care. I pushed my truck as fast as it would go as I barreled towards my fix. Oh, at least she's self-aware. Bella goes to Jacob's and he's almost finished one bike, but then he bemoans that he should drag it out because he thinks Bella won't hang out with him once the job is done. He is currently unaware that he is her new coping mechanism. He chuckled. You really like spending time with me? He asked, marvelling. Very, very much, and I'll prove it. I have to work tomorrow, but Wednesday we'll do something non-mechanical. Yes, I agreed. We'll have to start being responsible occasionally, or Billy and Charlie aren't going to be so easy going about this. I made a gesture, indicating the two of us as a single entity. He liked that. He beamed. God, he is like, he is actually like a dog, isn't he? He's just like from a toy. Also, she is leading him on. Bella goes home after a few hours. I checked my email before I started on my homework and there was a long one from Renee. She gushed over every detail I'd provided her with. So I sent back another exhausted description of my day. Everything but the motorcycles. Even happy-go-lucky Renee was likely to be alarmed by that. When you boil it down, isn't it weird that the plot of this book is basically Edward dumps Bella. Bella fixates on riding a motorbike to hear his voice. Question mark, question mark, question mark. Profit. School Tuesday had its ups and downs. Angela and Mike seemed ready to welcome me back with open arms to kindly overlook my few months of aberrant, aberrant, aberrant behaviour. Jess was more resistant. I wondered if she needed a formal written apology for the poor Angela's incident. Yeah, that's because Angela and Mike are simps, team Jess for the win. Just like Gilmore Girls, team Jess all the way. Mike is back at it again with his bullshit and he asked Bella out to the cinema on Friday. I don't date, I said slowly, realising how true that was. That whole world seemed impossibly distant. Just as friends, he suggested. His clear blue eyes were not as eager now. I hoped he really meant that we could be friends. Like, what? She's living in La La Land. Like, Bella, and anyone else who's listening, are better off having less friends than hanging out with dudes who are just waiting around to flip her. I've literally turned into moss. The thing is, Jacob kind of also falls into that category too, right? But she does have a real connection with him, so it's just very murky. 
her and Mike don't have anything in common. He doesn't even, uh, I think I highlight this at some point, he doesn't even get her personality or her like stupid jokes, whatever. So it doesn't even make sense to me that he has harbored a crush on her for over a year. Whereas her and Jacob, they get each other to an extent, right? Jacob stayed for dinner and took a plate home for Billy. He grudgingly added another year to my negotiable age for being a good cook. Friday was the garage and Saturday after my shift at Newton's was homework. This is reading like a diary entry. <clears throat> it's not interesting. Bella has another nightmare about being in a field. She, the, she has, she is the softest person, isn't she? And this also is not interesting. I have written grocery lists more interesting than any of this. Jacob calls Bella to say that the bikes are finished. That was quick, right? Two bikes, he's finished in what? A week? Does he not go to school? She goes to Jacob's where they collect the bikes and then drive off somewhere to ride them. She notices some figures cliff diving. She freaks out, but Jacob says it's just a reservation pastime because they don't have a mall. You jump off the cliff? I hadn't missed the us. Sure, sure, he shrugged and grinned. It's fun, a little scary, kind of a rush. I looked back at the cliffs where the third figure was pacing the edge. I'd never witnessed anything so reckless in my life. My eyes widened and I smiled. Jake, you have to take me cliff diving. Bella worries about not doing her homework on time, so you cannot convince me that she is up for cliff diving. I am not convinced by Bella's adrenaline junkie arc in the slightest. So who were those guys, the crazy ones, I wondered. He made disgusted sounds at the back of his throat, the Lapush gang. You have a gang? I asked. I realized that I sounded impressed. Oh good, Bella Swan Mafia arc when. Sam Yuli is the leader of the gang, but they call themselves peacekeepers. Where have we heard that before? Quill said something, you know how he's got a big mouth. And it, well, actually we don't know, because we've not really seen it, apart from like, what, two sentences? So don't know, just taking your word for it. And it pissed Paul off. His eyes got all dark and he sort of smiled. No, he showed his teeth, but he didn't smile. And it was like he was so mad he was shaking or something. But Sam put his hand against Paul's chest and shook his head. Paul looked at him for a minute and calmed down. Honestly, it was like Sam was holding him back, like Paul was going to tear us up if Sam didn't stop him, he groaned. Spoiler alert, but these guys are werewolves. Paul, Sam. Very good idea for hormonal teenage boys to have the power to transform into gigantic, really strong wolves. What could possibly go wrong? He sighed. It's just the way they treat me. It creeps me out. The words started to rush out now. You know the council is supposed to be made up of equals, but if there was a leader, it would be my dad. I've never been able to figure out why people treat him the way they do, why his opinion counts the most. It's got something to do with his father and his father's father. My great grandpa, Ephraim Black, was the sort of last chief we had, and they still listen to Billy, maybe because of that. But I'm just like everyone else. No one treats me special until now. Jacob is a Mary Sue, a, a Gary Stew, whatever you, the male equivalent. I don't know how I miss the signs. Oh, Jacob thinks that Samuel Lee is going to push him into joining his cult gang. You don't have to join anything, my voice was angry. This was really upsetting Jacob and that infuriated me. Who did these protectors think they were? Bella is a weird sponge. She is totally that girl that's like, oh my God, Bex, please don't cry, babes. Cause you know that when you cry, I'll just start crying too and I can't help myself. Ever. And turns it into like about them. It's not about you, it's about the person who's crying. She is that girl. Embry hasn't been hanging out with Jacob anymore because he is a werewolf. So he's hanging out with Sam's gang now. He was biting his lower lip and clenching his hands. He looked like he was about to cry. I threw my arms around him instinctively, wrapping them around his waist and pressing my face in against his chest. He was so big, I felt like I was a child hugging a grown up. Maybe I'm that kind of guy. In the first Twilight, go check my previous video. There is a lot of references to Bella feeling like a child in Edward's arms. I think Maya's kink is infantilization. Jacob pops a boner over being hugged. He was frozen for a second and his long arms wrapped hesitantly around me. Thanks, Bella. His voice was huskier than usual. We stood like that for a moment and it didn't upset me. In fact, I felt comforted by the contact. This didn't feel anything like the last time someone had embraced me this way. This was friendship. And yeah, it sure is friendship and it's <laughs> hard on like digging into your side. And Jacob was very warm. Bet he was sort of blood pumping. If this is going to, if this is how you're going to react, I'll freak out more often. Jacob's voice was like normal again, and his laughter rumbled against my ear. His fingers touched my hair, soft and tentative. Well, it was friendship for me. I pulled away quickly, laughing with him, but determined to put things back into perspective at once. 
It's hard to believe I'm two years older than you, I said, emphasizing the word older. You make me feel like a dwarf. Standing this close, is that PC? Standing this close to him, I really had to crane my neck to see his face. Just like, tell him you don't fancy him, put him out of his misery. Don't sit there embracing him for like a whole minute at a time and holding his hands and stuff. Just tell him you're not interested that way and then go find someone else to be friends with. Chapter eight, Adrenaline. Ironically, something you will never experience when reading these books. Jacob is trying to teach Bella how to use the bike. I will not judge her for this. I tried to learn how to use a motorbike and I failed miserably and kept but actually falling off when it was stationary. And then I had to get a moped instead. So I'm not going to judge her for this. Uh-huh, I muttered, afraid to say more. My stomach was contorting strangely and I thought my voice might crack. I was terrified. I tried to tell myself that the fear was pointless, that I'd already lived through the worst thing possible. In comparison with that, why should anything frighten me now? I should be able to look deaf in the face and laugh. My stomach wasn't buying it. Do you want to know why that is? That's because your body and subconscious know that getting a cracked skull and slash or the eternity of the void is actually worse than your stupid annoying boyfriend dumping you, your brat. As I began to loosen my grip, I was shocked to be interrupted by a voice that did not belong to the boy standing next to me. This is reckless and childish and idiotic, Bella. The velvet voice fumed. Yeah, no one asked you. Oh, I gasped and my hand fell off the clutch. The bike bucked under me, yanking me forward and then collapsed into the ground half on top of me. The growling engine choked to a stop. Bella? Jacob jerked. Yeah, I bet he did. The heavy bike offered me of ease. Are you hurt? But I wasn't listening. I told you so, the perfect voice murmured, crystal clear. Even as part of her subconscious, he is condescending. This is telling me a lot about her self-esteem. She should really go to therapy. The therapist would have a field day. Go home to Charlie, the voice ordered. The sheer beauty of it amazed me. I couldn't allow my memory to lose it, no matter the price. Christ, imagine if he actually never returns at the end of the book and she lived out her days, eventually marrying Jacob for comfort to use him, popping out some puppies and then some grand puppies. And then she's 80 years old, still cliff diving to try to hear Edward's voice. Pathetic. Bella rides her bike for 10 seconds and then falls off and cuts her head. Jacob takes off his shirt so he can quell the blood leaking from her skull. Jacob drives Bella to the hospital and then she perves on him. Jacob really did look older than 16. Not quite 40, but maybe older than me. So? Like, he's... What, so? Doesn't matter how he looks. Quill didn't have too much on him in the muscle department. For all that, Jacob claimed to be a skeleton. The muscles were the long, wiry kind, but they were definitely there under the smooth skin. His skin was such a pretty colour, it made me jealous. Jacob noticed my scrutiny. What? He asked, suddenly self-conscious. Nothing, I just hadn't realised before. Did you know? You're sort of beautiful. Once the word slipped out, I worried he might take my impulsive observation the wrong way. But Jacob just rolled his eyes. You hit your head pretty hard, didn't you? Based. Bella gets stitches and goes home and Charlie is like, lol, whatever, you're always cracking your head open, no big deal. This night was not as bad as the first night after I'd heard the perfect voice in Port Angeles. The hole came back the way it always did when I was away from Jacob, but it didn't throb so badly around the edges. I was already planning ahead, looking forward to more delusions, and that was a distraction. Also, I knew I would feel better tomorrow when I was with Jacob again. The next Wednesday, before I could get home from the ER, Dr. Gerandi called to warn my father that I might possibly have a concussion and advised him to wake me up every two hours through the night to make sure it wasn't serious. Charlie's eyes narrowed suspiciously and my weak explanation about tripping again. I mean, she gets injured a lot. I know that there's some level of, oh, she's always like, you know, tripping over and stuff, but getting concussions, constant cuts on her heads. How are her, her parents not more concerned? Also, right. Bella keeps riding the bike and hurting herself. That is lovely. Such a good role model. Hey, teenage girls, did your boyfriend dump you? Hmm, well, don't worry. Just do increasingly dangerous things so you can hallucinate his voice and everything will be okay and you'll feel better. Such a weird message to send. I'd had the most amazing hallucination today. Honestly, Bella, please just do drugs. It'll be easier to explain than this. Charlie worries, so Bella says she's been tripping whilst hiking and he says to watch out for the big bears that keep being sighted. Sure, sure. I said quickly. Get your own personality, you absolute freak shy. It's not normal. Bella is with Jacob and wants to hike to find the meadow that Edward showed off his glittery skin in. He whistled cheerfully, an unfamiliar tune, swinging his arms around and moving easily through the rough undergrowth. The shadows didn't seem as dark as usual. 
Not with my personal son along. She's been hanging out with him at this stage for like a month, less than a month. For someone who claims to be so detached and different from everyone else, she sure does suck herself hard onto supernaturals. They spend the day hiking. They don't find the meadow. I don't find my will to live. Bears don't want to eat people. We don't taste that good. He grinned at me in the dark cab. Of course, you might be an exception. I bet you'd taste good. Kill it, kill it with fire. Chapter nine, third wheel. Bella is in a new routine of school, work, hanging out with Jacob, and then we are treated to this pathetic gyre drive. I was like a lost moon, my planet destroyed in some cataclysmic disaster movie scenario of desolation that continued, nevertheless, to circle in a tight little orbit around the empty space left behind, ignoring the laws of gravity. You know how pretty much everyone goes through life thinking that they are the star of their own show, because I guess we all kind of are. The star of Bella's show is Edward, and he quit at the beginning of the book. It's Valentine's Day, Jacob gives Bella candy. Jacob shook his head with mock sadness. This month started in February, didn't it? It's been two weeks. It's been two weeks. And she's like morphed, tried to morph her personality into Jacob's. Two weeks. You can be so of it sometimes. Yes, it is the 14th day of February. So are you going to be my Valentine? Since you didn't get me a 50 cents box of candy, it's the least you can do. I started to feel uncomfortable. The words were teasing, but only on the surface. What exactly does that entail? I hedged. The usual, slave for life, that kind of thing. Oh, well, if that's all. I took the candy. But I was trying to think of some way to make the boundaries clear. Again. They seem to get blurred a lot with Jacob. Just literally just say to him, mate. Just say like you're not into him. I could have saved you an entire book worth of angst. So he fancies her, right? Hard. She is aware. She doesn't distance herself from him so he can get over it. Instead, she hangs out with him at every single opportunity to distract herself from the hole left gaping by Edward's absence. Sort it out. Bella invites Jacob to the movie on Friday with her friends and Mike. Drama alert. Hey Mike, I said when class was over. Are you free Friday night? He looked up, his blue eyes instantly hopeful. Yeah, I am. You want to go out? I worded my reply carefully. I was thinking about getting a group, I emphasized the words, to go see Crosshairs. I'd done my homework. It's some sort of action film. Sure, he agreed, visibly less eager. I don't know why Bella acts like this with Mike. She doesn't really like him as a person. She's never like saying about his positives. She also, she must know on some level that he fancies her, like she does, right? Cause she can see that he's less eager at the thought of it being a group activity instead of a one-on-one -on -one date. So I don't get like, this is all very self-conflicted. It's very contrite, this drama. It's just, it's so pointless. Just find some boys that don't fancy you to be friends with. It's, it's really not as difficult as one would think. Well, maybe not difficult for me because I'm a swamp beast. Uh, it must be difficult for Bella though because she's just so hmm, quirky and small and perfect. Tee hee. And all the boys love her. She'd do well in Gilmore Girls, wouldn't she? After a second, he perked back up to near his former excitement level. How about we get Angela and Ben or Eric and Katie? He was determined to make this some kind of a double date apparently. See, what is the point? Just don't hang out with him. That You don't need to, stop. I want to see crosshairs, I insisted. I'm in the mood for action. Bring on the blood and guts. <laughs> yeah, all right. Miss does calculus in her car. Okay, Mike turned away, but not before I saw his maybe she's crazy after all expression. I don't know why Mike fancies Bella. He doesn't get her personality or her uh, jokes. Heavy quotations on personality and jokes. And Maya insists on telling us, even outside of these books, that no, Bella is just plain and average looking. It's just that she was a new person at the school and she was like a new toy, so everyone like fancied her, blah, blah, blah. It's like, sure, a small crush at the prospect of someone just being new, I get that. Not a sustained one for over a year when she's, she's plain and he doesn't get her personality or, who knows? Jacob is at Bella's with his car that he's finished repairing. Incredible, I held my hand up for a high five. He smacked his hand against mine, but left it there, twisting his fingers through mine. So do I get to drive tonight? She stays holding his hand until Mike arrives. Who is blurring the lines now, Bella? Stop holding his hand if you don't want him to get the wrong impression. Jacob and Mike dick swing a bit over Bella, Ben and Angela bail on going to the movie. Hey, do you mind if Jacob drives? I asked. I told him he could. He just finished his car. He built it from scratch all by himself. I bragged, proud as a PTA mum with a student on the principal's list. Bella is weird. I guess technically by the end of this, Bella is Jacob's mother-in-law, right? 
Isn't that weird though? Don't you, like that's it's stupid. It's stupid. It's not even weird. Imagine one of your closest friends fancies you, but actually they only fancy you because you have an egg inside of you that they're fated to be with, and then you become their mother-in-law. What? Jacob was his normal sunny self, chattering away until I'd all but forgotten Mike's silently sulking in the back. Why is she even pretending to be friends with him? Mike wonders why they aren't listening to music. Yes, Jacob answered, but Bella doesn't like music. I stared at Jacob, surprised. I'd never told him that. Bella? Mike asked, annoyed. He's right, I mumbled, still looking at Jacob's serene profile. How can you not like music? Mike demanded. I shrugged. I don't know. It just irritates me. Imagine disliking an entire sensory experience just because your boyfriend dumped you. It'd be like walking around with your eyes closed, being like, yeah, just since, since he's been gone, I just don't like seeing things because there's an absence of it. They go to the movies. Jacob and Bella enjoy how ridiculous the film is. After that, I really watched the show, laughing with him as the mayhem got more and more ridiculous. How was I ever going to fight the blurring lines in our relationship when I enjoyed being with him so much? Here's the thing about like their actual genuine connection. I think they have more of a connection than she and Edward because she actually has fun with Jacob. I read the first one. I don't really remember her having fun with Edward. It's just a lot of, um, just a lot, a lot of angsting. A lot of, oh, you're so good looking. I could never be good enough for you. There's not enough like actual fun times between her and Edward. Before Maya, character assassinates Jacob in the third book by having him commit an assault, right? To make him, oh no, he's, he's the bad guy. It was a character assassination. My theory is, is because I think she might have realized a little bit that Jacob was better with Bella and cooler than Edward. So she had to pull out something really major to assassinate his character. But even then a lot of the fan base didn't actually see it as what it was assault maybe because they were too young to appreciate appreciate you know both jacob and mike had claimed the armrest on either side of me both of their hands rested lightly palms up in an unnatural looking position like steel bear traps open and ready jacob was in the habit of taking my hand whenever the opportunity presented itself but here in the darkened movie theater with mike watching it would have a different significance and i was sure he knew that i couldn't believe that mike was thinking the same thing but his hand was placed exactly like jacob's mike gets sick and leaves relatable. I joined him with a sigh. He looked like he was thinking about blurring more lines. Sure enough, as soon as I sat down, he shifted over to put his arm around my shoulders. Jake, I protested, leaning away. He dropped his arm, not looking at all bothered by the minor rejection. He reached out and took my hand firmly, wrapping his other hand around my wrist when I tried to pull away again. Where did he get the confidence from? Why is she entertaining this? Oh, you're like my best friend. They've been hanging out for two weeks. I thought it was a month and it, even that is still like... Pfft. Come on, it's a month. I've had people that I've hung out with for a month and then not really spoken to again. Like, but I don't know why she entertains this if she doesn't like it. I don't want anyone to project and be like, well, oh, she could feel threatened by him because she doesn't, she's at ease. So let's not project and be like, well, he could react badly and try and hurt her. It's not how his character is written in this book. But if I fully wasn't interested in a dude and they kept trying to hold my hand, I would lamp them and end the friendship. She should end the friendship because they're not on the same wavelength at all, but she won't because she wants to use him. I grimaced. I didn't want to do this. Not just not now, but not ever. There was nothing left in my life at this point that was more important than Jacob Black hangs out of a guy for two weeks, jeez. But he seemed determined to ruin everything. She is blurring the lines herself. She has become so attached to him so quickly. No wonder he might be misinterpreting it. How would you interpret that? If like this person just shows up out of the blue and is trying to spend every single waking moment with you. Look, I like my close friends. I couldn't hang out with them non-stop for two weeks straight. I've got my own life, got things to do. Well, she doesn't have her own life, maybe it's that. Why is he not hanging out with any of his friends? God, oh, he's totally that guy that ditches all of his friends for a girl. There's a lot of stuff in the Twilight world that doesn't make any sense. Jake asks if he only likes her. It was hard to answer to say the word. Would he get hurt and avoid me? How would I stand there? Yes, I whispered. He grinned down at me. That's okay, you know, as long as you like me the best and you think I'm good looking, sort of. I'm prepared to be annoyingly persistent. I'm not going to change, I said. And though I tried to keep my voice normal, I could hear the sadness in it. This is the exact moment where she should cut him off. She says she's not interested, but he's like, I'll be persistent and I hope that one day you throw me a pathetic bone. But she won't cut him off because then how would she be able to use his company to distract from Edward's absence? It's a mess. But don't get mad at me for hanging around, okay? Jacob patted the back of my hand because I'm not giving up. 
I've got loads of free time. I sighed. You shouldn't waste it on me, I said, though I wanted him to. You shouldn't waste your time on me, but I want you to. Especially if he was willing to accept me the way I was. Damaged goods. Damaged goods. God. It's what I want to do, as long as you still like to be with me. I can't imagine how I could not like being with you, I told him honestly. Well, just don't expect more, I warned him, trying to pull my hand away. He held onto it obstinately. This doesn't really bother you, does it? He demanded, squeezing my fingers. No, I sighed. Truthfully, it felt nice. His hand was so much warmer than mine. I always felt too cold these days. So what's the problem? The problem, I said, is that it means something different to me than it does to you. Well, he tightened his hand around mine. That's my problem, isn't it? He is a mug for sticking around. She is a mug for letting him. Pair of mugs. Maybe they are suited for each other. Why would you want to stay friends with someone who is in love with you? Like, your friendship cannot be even if someone's in love with you and you don't feel the same way that you're never going to feel the same way. That's, that's not a real friendship, is it? How would you not be suspicious of all of their actions? The only reason I could think that you'd keep someone around if you knew they were in love with you and you didn't feel the same way is if you wanted to use them for stuff, right? Mike comes out of the toilet after vomiting. He's caught the flu. They drive home. Jacob is also burning, but he feels fine. <sighs> then we have this. I stared out the windshield, consumed with guilt. It was so wrong to encourage Jacob. Pure selfishness. It didn't matter that I tried to make my position clear. If he felt any hope at all that this could turn into something other than friendship, then I hadn't been clear enough. How could I explain so that he would understand? I was an empty shell, like a vacant house, condemned. For months I'd been utterly inhabitable. Now I was a little improved. The front room was in better repair, but that was all. Just the one small piece. He deserved better than that. Better than a one room falling down fixer-upper. No amount of investment on his part could put me back in working order. Yet I knew that I wouldn't send him away regardless. I needed him too much and I was selfish. Maybe I could make my side more clear so that he would know to leave me. The thought made me shudder and Jacob tightened his arm around me. What in the self-inflicted problem is this? Jacob now feels sick so he goes home. How much I wish that Jacob Black had been born my brother, my flesh and blood brother, so that I would have some legitimate claim on him that still left me free of any blame now. Heaven knows I had never wanted to use Jacob, but I couldn't help but interpret the guilt I felt now to mean that I had. <laughs> Even more, I had never meant to love him. Only one thing I truly knew. Knew it in the pit of my stomach and the centre of my bones. Knew it from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. Knew it deep in my empty chest was how love gave someone the power to break you. But I needed Jacob now. Needed him like a drug. I'd used him as a crutch for too long. It's been two weeks, babe. Oh my God. And I was in deeper than I'd planned to go of anyone again. Now I couldn't bear for him to be hurt and I couldn't keep from hurting him either. He thought time and patience would change me and though I knew he was dead wrong, I also knew that I would let him try. He was my best friend. I would always love him and it would never, ever be enough. What? Bella rings Jacob to find out if he got home, but Billy answers and he's vague booking. Bella gets the flu too. Must have been all that unchristian hand holding. She recovers after 24 hours. My God, this book is dry. She calls Jacob and he answers. He tells her that his entire body hurts. He doesn't think it's the flu, but she can't come visit. He promises to call. Chapter 10, The Meadow. Jacob didn't call. Lol, get wrecked. I called again, several times a day for the next two days, but no one was ever there. Bella decides to be a stalker. Saturday, I decided to go see him, invitation be damned, but the little red house was empty. This frightened me. Was Jacob so sick that he'd needed to go to the hospital? I stopped by the hospital on the way back home, but the nurse at the front desk told me neither Jacob nor Billy had been in. So obsessive. Stop. It's friends with Guy for two weeks. We had a chocolate milk break. Outro. Chocolate milk. Protein. Plant protein milk. Who thinks of these things? Who thinks? You know what that milk needs? More protein. Tastes all right though, so there's that. <sighs> Charlie calls Harry Clearwater, who tells him that he's been in the hospital for heart tests, and then tells Charlie there's an issue with the phone lines and that Jake has mono, so he's not allowed any visitors. Bella researches mono on the computer, of course she bloody does, <laughs> on the computer machine, and doesn't believe that Jacob has it. I'd give Billy a week, I decided, before I got pushy. A week was generous. She's turned into Edward. Bella starts having breakdowns without Jacob around. This is why you don't replace one codependent unhealthy relationship with another 
There is a man on the news right now. I don't think he's aware that the cameras are on him because he's just like this. Saturday comes, so Bella rings Jacob, but he's not in and Billy is still busy vague booking. Billy is being vague because Jacob, spoiler alert, has had his wolfy transformation. And I suppose Billy doesn't want Bella to know about it. So he's just being rude to her. But he knows that she knows about vam the vampires and the Cullens being vampires. So would it actually matter if she knew that Jacob was a werewolf? Jacob was better, but not well enough to call me. He was out with friends. I was sitting home, missing him more. Why do I suddenly feel so happy? Is it just this? Is it just sugar? Sometimes I think I replaced my unhealthy coping mechanisms, i.e. cocaine and alcohol, with sugar. I was sitting home, missing him more every hour. I was lonely, worried, bored, perforated, and now also desolate as I realised that the weaker part had not had the same effect on him. Do you know what, Bella? I know what might have helped with your problems. Buy an Xbox or something to that equivalent. Buy The Witcher 3, Nier Automata, something like Final Fantasy, something that you can really just dig it. Just play games. It, it helps. <laughs> but anyway, this is not normal behaviour. Can't stress that enough. Charlie worries that if Jacob ditches Bella, Bella will become a mope monster 3000 again. So Bella lies and says that she will talk to her other mates. What mates? All Bella does is eat hot chip and lie. That's a good idea. You've been spending so much time with Jacob. Your other friends are going to think you've forgotten about them. I smiled and nodded as if I cared what my other friends thought. She's an awful friend, right? She doesn't have other friends. And she's just like, she's such a teenager. As if I care what... Not me acting like I don't behave like that sometimes. I don't care what anyone else thinks, do I want? <laughs> As everyone tells me not to touch the hot plate. What do you guys know? Charlie tells Bella to avoid the woods because a hiker went missing and he thinks it's the big wolf bears. Bella decides to ignore Charlie's advice, of course, and go hiking to find the meadow instead. She finds the meadow and is disappointed because, I don't know, Edward isn't magically there or something. A figure comes into the meadow. It's Laurent, the vampire from the first book. Bella, he asked, looking more astonished than I felt. You remembered, I smiled. It was ridiculous that I should be so elated because a vampire knew my name. He grinned. I don't expect to see you here. He strolled towards me, his expression bemused. Her self-esteem is solely reliant upon the opinions and recollections of supernatural beings. Laurent expresses surprise that the Cullens left their human pet behind and Bella notices that his eyes are red, which means he's been drinking human blood. Bella then hallucinates Edward's voice, telling her to lie so that Laurent doesn't eat her. Laurent reveals that Victoria, the vampire from the first book, wants to kill Bella for Edward killing James. Laurent was oblivious to my reaction. She thought it more appropriate to kill you than Edward. A fair turnabout, mate for a mate. She asked me to get the lay of the land for her, so to speak. I didn't imagine that you'd be so easy to get to. So maybe her plan was flawed. Apparently it wouldn't be the revenge she imagined, since you must not mean very much to him if he left you here unprotected. Ooh, emotional damage. But did Edward ever predict this possibility? I can't remember, but I'm gonna say no because he's selfish and self-absorbed. Laurent, Laurent, let's just call him Laurie. Laurie decides that he wants to do us all a favor and kill Bella. He is the real MVP. Bella decides in her final moments to think of Edward and says that she loves him. I really don't care. Sorry, I'm just busy thinking about if you put chocolate milk on chocolate cereal, would that taste good? If I had one regret about turning vegan all those years ago, it would be that I never got a bowl of Maltesers and poured cow milk on them and tried to eat Maltesers as a cereal because I saw someone do that in My Parents Are Aliens. Or Smarties in milk as, no, that'd be a bit weird, wouldn't it? Or would it? I don't know. Someone try it out for me and let me know the results in the comments below. <laughs> right, where were we? Then I saw it. A huge black shape eased out of the trees, quiet as a shadow and stalked deliberately towards the vampire. It was enormous, as tall as a house, but thick, oh, as a horse, <laughs> as tall as a horse. That is, that is tall, but thicker, much more muscular. You know, Oh, they're mass they're bloody massive, aren't they? Especially like some of them get well big. That is tall. Like a But then I, I swear in the film they weren't that big. Could our oxygen levels support such massive creatures with these high metabolisms? 
There's a reason everything's smaller. It's because the oxygen like rates or levels or percentage, it's twenty one percent compared to like the one the one of the Triassic eras when it was forty percent, and that's why like insects were massive because they breathe most of them breathe through their skin. And there's, there's some quick facts for you. Are you impressed or what? I wonder. Oh, it's, they're supernatural. It doesn't matter, does it? But it's just like they that is big. They are big. I'm just jumping ahead of myself, but they're as fast as vampires, but they're that big. I just don't, it, it, something about it doesn't make sense in my head. Maybe that's my own shortcomings in my imagination. Tall as a horse, but thicker, much more muscular. The long muzzle grimaced, revealing a line of dagger-like incisors. A grisly snarl rolled out from between the teeth, t rumbling across the clearing like a prolonged crack of thunder. Why are the werewolves so big? What about, like, why? I suppose because I'm kind of thinking, well, surely the bigger you are, you're not going to be as fast as something smaller. Right? Forget it. Then a pack of werewolves appear. The wolf closest to me, the reddish brown one, turned its head slightly at the sound of my gasp. The wolf's eyes were dark, nearly black. It gazed at me for a fraction of a second, the deep eyes seeming too intelligent for a wild animal. As it stared at me, I thought suddenly of Jacob, again with gratitude. At least I'd come here alone to this fairy tale meadow filled with dark monsters. At least Jacob wasn't going to die too. At least I wouldn't have his death on my hands. This is all the subtlety of a sledgehammer. Laurie runs away and the wolves run after him. Bella runs off and gets lost in the woods again, but she manages to make it back to her truck. Charlie is big mad that Bella has been out for so long, like during the day. Who are these parents in these books? Bella is 18. She can spend a day outside by herself if she wants. Bella tells Charlie about the big wolves and then she goes to her room to freak out about Victoria wanting to hunt her down. I feel like Edward is trying to track Victoria down at this point, but he's doing a piss poor job of it. Bella has a dream. In my imagination, Victoria's eyes were black with thirst, bright with anticipation, and her lips curled back from her gleaming teeth in pleasure. Her red hair was brilliant as fire. It blew chaotically around her wild face. Laurie's words repeated in my head, if you knew what she had planned for you. I pressed my fist against my mouth to keep from screaming. I know a vampire is after her and that's scary and all, but she's so wimpy, she's always screaming. My dog has more balls than Bella and he's neutered. Anyway, the chapter ends. Chapter 11, cult. Bella keeps freaking out about Victoria and missing Jacob. On Wednesday, I called every half hour until after 11 at night, desperate to hear the warmth of Jacob's voice. She needs locking up. Jacob avoided me, Charlie saying he looked strange, upset, Billy's vague, unhelpful answers. Holy crow, I knew exactly what was going on with Jacob. Holy crow. Bella thinks Jacob is now in Sam Yulee's cult, even though she lived through the first twilight and the answers of the werewolves are literally right there. And she's even seen the wolves herself. And she even had a sudden thought of Jacob when she looked at one of the wolves. It's just, it's, it's so annoying that it's obvious that she doesn't get it. Bella rings her dad to report Samuel Lee to the police for being a cult leader. <laughs> yeah, it sounds ridiculous now, said it. Charlie doesn't listen to Bella because Samuel Lee is a great kid, right? And Bella is just a silly hysterical woman who should not be taken seriously. It's actually conflicting because like, Bella not being taken seriously because she's this hysterical, like silly woman is inherently anti-feminist and yet she is a hysterical, silly person. It's very conflicting for me. Charlie is like, what else, Bells? We've got a wolf problem to take care of. So Bella rings Billy to harass him further. I drove to La Push, determined to wait. I'd sit out front of his house all night if I had to. I'd miss school. The boy was going to have to come home sometime. When he did, he was going to have to talk to me. What a freak. Bella sees Quill and offers him a ride. He ignores stranger danger and she interrogates him about Jacob. I tried to follow them. He was with Embry. His voice was low, hard to hear of the engine. I leaned closer. I know they saw me, but they turned and just disappeared into the trees. I don't think they were alone. I think Sam and his crew might have been with them. So when they turn into wolves, they will act like jerks to their human friends, for whatever reason. She drops Quill off and goes to stalk Jacob. What are you doing here, Bella? Jacob growled. I stared at him in blank astonishment. Jacob had radically changed in the last few weeks I'd seen him. The first thing I noticed was his hair. His beautiful hair was all gone, cropped quite short, covering his head with an inky gloss like black satin. The planes of his face seemed to have hardened. Jacob, I whispered. He just stared at me, his eyes tense and angry. Why is he being so angry? It's so annoying. The rest of the gang is there and Bella wants to punch Sam Yuli, which is the most balls she's ever had. And this also makes her want to be a vampire so she could be powerful and punch him and it would hurt. Okay. I want to talk to you, I said in a weak voice. I tried to focus, but I was still reeling against the escape of my taboo dream. 
Go ahead, he hissed for his teeth. His glare was vicious. I'd never seen him look at anyone like that, least of all me. It hurt with a surprising intensity, a physical pain, a stabbing in my head. Why is he so pressed? Jacob and Bella talk, which amounts to Jacob saying, I can't tell you what's up and we're not friends anymore. Don't you dare tell me I'm wrong. I'm not the one who got brainwashed. Tell me now whose fault this all is, if it's not your precious Sam. You asked for it, he growled at me, eyes glinting hard. If you want to blame someone, why don't you point your finger at those filthy reeking bloodsuckers that you love so much? So Jacob knows what's up at this point, but Bella tries to lie to him to protect the Cullens who ghosted her because Edward cried. Get a grip. Jacob has a minor meltdown and he hits a tree. What is it with the supernatural men in these books and hitting trees? Is this just like a modern version of Jesus cursing the fig tree for literally no reason? Is that what this is? Christian anti-tree propaganda? Go home, Bella. I can't hang out with you anymore. The silly inconsequential hurt was incredibly potent. The tears welled up again. Are you breaking up with me? The words were all wrong, but they were the best way I could think to phrase what I was asking. After all, what Jake and I had <laughs> was more than any schoolyard romance. Stronger. Just being like best mates with him, best mates with him for two weeks. Ignoring Bella willfully blurring the lines of their friendship again, why can't they hang out? They know Bella knows about vampires and that she managed to keep it a secret. So what does it really matter if she knows about werewolves? She's clearly good at keeping things hidden. So it, it's very forced that suddenly they just can't hang out. I'm sorry that I couldn't before. I wish I could change how I feel about you, Jacob. I was desperate, reaching, stretching the truth so far that it curved nearly into the shape of a lie. Maybe, maybe I would change, I whispered. Maybe if you gave me some time. Just don't quit on me now, Jacob. I can't take it. I have it, that is the evidence to my theory. She is lying about maybe one day she could return his feelings. She could fall in love with him and they could be together, but only if he doesn't just make her lonely now because he's our coping mechanism for life. She is leading him on. I proved it, you can't argue with me. And if you do, I won't listen. <laughs> it's not you, it's me, I whispered. There's a new one. I mean it, Bella. I'm not, he struggled, his voice getting even huskier as he fought to control his emotion. His eyes were tortured. I'm not good enough to be your friend anymore or anything else. I'm not what I was before. I'm not good. What in the teenage angst is this? Why would being able to shapeshift into a giant wolf to protect humans against vampires, that is the function of them having the shapeshifting powers in the first place, to protect humans? Why would that make Jacob feel like he's a bad guy? He's doing a good thing. It's so forced. Shapeshifting into a giant wolf would be awesome. It would be hella metal. Shut up, Mayor. Jacob runs into his house like a wee little baby and Biddy comes out to tell Bella to go home. Not as bad, not as bad, my mind tried to comfort me. It was true, this wasn't as bad. This wasn't the end of the world, not again. This was just the end of what little peace there was left behind, that was all. Not as bad, I agreed, then added, but bad enough. I thought Jacob had been healing the hole in me, or at least plugging it up, keeping it from hurting me so much. I'd been wrong. He'd been carving out his own hole, so now that I was riddled through like Swiss cheese, I wondered why I didn't crumble into pieces. Oh my God, shut up, please shut up. <sighs> Bella goes home and Charlie worries that she's going to turn into a zombie again. She tells Charlie that Sam said Jacob can't be her friend. Charlie rings Billy to yell at him. This is very like juvenile, isn't it? It's very kindergarten. So Billy was going to blame me. I was leading Jacob on, he'd finally had enough. Well, Bella has a new dream. This is not interesting to recount. Bella awakens to someone scratching at her window. Chapter 12, Intruder. Bella worries that it's Victoria outside her window, but it's actually Jacob. He's swinging on a tree and he Tarzans his way into her bedroom and her heart. Bella gets mad and tells Jacob to leave, but he wants to say sorry. And then he vague books about not being able to explain himself. For anyone who doesn't understand what I mean by vague booking, you know when sometimes like some, usually mums, write things on Facebook like, had enough, just don't, I've had enough of everything. And then people are like, oh my God, PM me, honey, you okay, XOXO. And then they reply back being like, don't worry, babes, it's okay. That is vague booking. Bella is an absolute simp. No one in fiction does get an angry properly. Here's what you do if people are being stupid and annoying and pissing you off. You tell them to do one and you stick with it and you make them sweat for at least a few days. Maybe six, if you can handle it, six months is usually good. That is my toxic trait that I will never give up. I don't know why you came here, Jacob, if you were just going to give me riddles instead of answers. I'm sorry, he whispered. This is so frustrating. We looked at each other for a long moment in the dark room, both our faces hopeless. 
The part that kills me, he said abruptly, is that you already know. I already told you everything. Yeah, but unless it's something directly about the column, she's not gonna bother to memorize it, mate. There's something about being in a pack that makes it physically impossible for Jacob to tell other people the secret. Now that he's a wolf. It's very annoying. He gives Bella clues, but she's a donut, so she doesn't get it. He took a steady in breath and nodded. Maybe it will come back to you. I guess I understand why you only remember the one story he added in a sarcastic, bitter tone. Bella suggests that they run away together. Why is that her like usual plan for anything? Let's just run away. And he's like, gotta go, sorry. Then why aren't you supposed to see me? I demanded. It's not safe, he mumbled, looking down. Bella thinks this is about her and Victoria because she thinks everything is about her, but he means it's not safe for her in case he gets mad and transforms. She could get injured. He saw the incomprehension in my face. After that stupid movie, he reminded me, I promised you that I wouldn't ever hurt you. So I really blew it this afternoon, didn't I? I know you didn't want to do it, Jake. It's okay. Pathetic. If someone spoke to me how Jacob did earlier to her, unprompted, naturally, I'd block them for at least a few months for a laugh. Look at that woman over there. No, you My toxic trait is I actually stand up for myself. He leaves, Bella falls asleep, and then dreams a similar dream to the one she had in the first book when she realized that Edward was a vampire. So of course, Bella sees in her dream that Jacob is a werewolf and she wakes up screaming. Why? So soft. She recounts the same convo from the first book and finally works it out. What kind of place was this? Could a world really exist where ancient legends went wandering around the borders of tiny and significant towns, facing down mythical monsters? Did this mean every impossible fairy tale was grounded somewhere in absolute truth? Was there anything sane or normal at all? Or was everything just magic and ghost stories? I don't know. Besides, there'd never been one moment that I wasn't completely aware that Edward Cullen was above and beyond the ordinary. It wasn't such a surprise to find out what he was, because he so obviously was something. This is like really, like subtly mean to Jacob, isn't it? But Jacob, Jacob who was just Jacob and nothing more than that. Like, oh, Edward was so obviously something because he's just so good looking. That is entirely what she's basing it on because she's always going on about how good looking he is. But oh, Jacob, he's just like, hmm, the person. Ugh. Jacob, my friend. Jacob, the only human that I'd ever been able to relate to. And he wasn't even human. I fought the urge to scream again. What did this say about me? How on earth has she managed to make Jacob's potentially like traumatizing ordeal that he's going through right now? All about herself. How has she managed to do that? World War me. I knew the answer to that one. It said that there was something deeply wrong with me. Why else would my life be filled with characters from horror movies? Why else would I care so much about them that it would tear big chunks right out of my chest when they went off along their mythical ways? <sighs> she runs into Charlie, who tells her there's been another wolf attack. Jacob was my best friend, but was he a monster too? A real one? A bad one? Should I warn him if he and his friends were were murderers, if they were out slaughtering innocent hikers in cold blood, if they were truly creatures from a horror movie in every sense, would it be wrong to protect them? So without knowing anything about the wolf pack, she prejudges them and decides they aren't as good as the nice Cullens. But it couldn't be worse than what the Cullens endured in their quest to be good. I thought of Esme, the tears started when I pictured her kind, lovely face, and how as lovely and loving as she was, she'd had to hold her nose all ashamed and run for me when I was bleeding. It couldn't be harder than that. I thought of Carlyle, the centuries upon centuries that he had struggled to teach himself to ignore blood so he could save lives as a doctor. Nothing could be harder than that. The werewolves had chosen a different path. This would actively go against all the good stuff that people, Charlie, the adults on the reservation have been saying about Sam Yuli. So instead of just jump into like a rewild conclusion, why don't you just go talk to them? Oh my God, is that David Miliband? Oh, him and his brother sound so similar. I like Eddie more. The only Edgewood that I like around here. Chapter 13, Killer. Bella heads to La Push and starts to tell Billy that Charlie is out hunting giant wolves, so he finally relents and stops being vague. Billy nodded and then we gazed at each other for a minute. I was dying to ask him about his part in this. What did he think of what his son had become? But I knew how he'd supported Sam from the very beginning, so I suppose the murders must not bother him. How he justified that to himself, I couldn't imagine. Why is she jumping to these huge conclusions? She's known Billy her whole life. How can she suddenly think that he's an asset to murder? This is the conclusion she has drawn without anyone else's input or opinions. Edward, in the first book, point blank told her he killed 
loads of humans as a vampire and yet straight away her reaction to that was oh tee hee but they were bad anyway who cares right as if like who gave edward permission to be judged during an executioner in the first place right who gave him that right um but why don't the werewolves get the same benefit of the doubt can we call this racism or would it be more like supernatural speciesism? It's some form of ism going on. Jacob is sleeping, so Bella goes to the beach to wait for him. Jacob was my friend, whether he killed people or not. Stunning and brave. Anyway, Jacob is now there and they start bickering because they can't communicate properly. Jacob is being flippant about the wolf hunters and Bella thinks that he's going to be fine with killing Charlie because she just hasn't straight up asked are you killing the hikers? It's a pointless, like, roundabout cyclical conversation. It's annoying because no one's just being straight forward. Maybe, God, maybe, do people like that in books? Because I just find it infuriating when people aren't being straightforward with each other. I find it infuriating in films when a whole conflict arises from people just not being able to talk to each other. Like, there's a miscommunication or a misunderstanding and then that kind of forms the basis of the plot for the whole film. And that really annoys me because it's like, just flipping talk to people. Maybe my stories won't be interesting to people because I'm not going to have that kind of like forced drama in my stories because I find it infuriating. But anyway, Jacob, I pleaded, making my tone soft and even. Is it really necessary to kill people, Jacob? Isn't there some other way? I mean, if vampires can find a way to survive without murdering people, couldn't you give it a try too? He straightened up with a jerk, like my words had sent an electric shock through him. His eyebrows shot up and his eyes stared wide. Killing people, he demanded. What did you think we were talking about? They both have coconuts for brains. Jacob is happy that that was Bella's concern and that she doesn't care about the wolf boy thing. Personally, I would feel offended if my supposed close friend just assumed that because I turned into a werewolf or whatever, that yeah, I'm just murdering people now. I'd be kind of offended by the implication, but okay. He took one long stride and caught me in another vice tight bear hug. You really honestly don't mind that I morph into a giant dog? He asked, his voice joyful in my ear. Am I just a different breed of person? Because if, like, one of my close friends turned around to me and said, Elise, I've something to tell you. I can shapeshift into a real-life Pokemon. I'd be like, dude, that's awesome. Like, if one of my friends was actually secretly an alien this whole time, and then they told me one day, I'd think, wow, that is cool, man. I wouldn't be scared. I'm not scared of anything. <laughs> Jacob tells Bella he's not a killer, but his pack are trying to protect the humans. Jacob reveals his pack killed Laurie. How lucky for Bella then that she can now have supernatural bodyguards against Victoria. Jacob also reveals that Victoria has been stalking the area, but he doesn't know her as Victoria yet, just knows her as like the red-headed vampire. His voice faded until it sounded like something was coming through a long tunnel. I couldn't make out the individual words anymore. My forehead dude was sweat and my stomach rolled like I had the stomach flu again. Exactly like I had the flu. I turned away from him quickly, leaned over the tree trunk. My body convulsed with useless heaves, my empty stomach contracting with horrified nausea though there was nothing in it to expel. She is such a wimp, but why is she throwing up? How am I supposed to root for her? Like, it's boring. She's always screaming and being thrown up. Bella tells Jacob that Victoria is after her because Edward killed James. Jacob runs off to call a meeting with his pack. It was not a good time to be left alone. Seconds after Jacob was out of sight, I was hyperventilating. I dragged myself into the cab of the truck and mashed the locks down at once. It didn't make me feel any better. Jacob comes back to save Bella from herself and tells her his pack has telepathic powers with each other. Well, it would have stopped me, Jacob said, morose now. Remember how I couldn't finish my sentences last night? How I just couldn't tell you the whole story? Yeah, you looked like you were choking or something. He chuckled darkly. Close enough. Sam told me I couldn't tell you. He's the head of the pack, you know. He's the alpha. When he tells us to do something or not to do something, when he really means it, we can't ignore him. This sounds like a form of magical enslavement. They go off to talk to Jacob's pack. Chapter 14. Family. The pack appears in human form and they get big mad at Jacob for bringing Bella along, which, fair enough. A guy called Paul gets super mad and he shifts into a wolf he's so mad and he is ready to attack Bella. No one gives a shit about this in five minutes time, even though he could kill her and wants to kill her in this moment just for her existing, which I can't be down for that because it's so unnecessary. Jacob turns into a wolf and he has a dog fight with Paul. Sam tells the guys to take Bella to Emily's. Embry and Jared talk shit for a bit. No one cares that Paul clearly wanted to kill Bella. I wouldn't normally care either, but these guys are meant to be protectors. They're meant to be protecting humans. 
not that good at protecting than if they want to murder the first human that they don't agree with. They go to Emily's house. Bella is warned not to stare. Emily is Sam's fiance. Emily has three thick scars on the right side of her face. She gets busy making a lot of food for the wolf pack. The women in these books, all they do is make food for the men folk. Go away, Mayor. Sam comes in and is just so full of love for Emily. Then shut up and eat, Sam suggested, kissing Emily's ruined mouth again. Bella, that is a very rude thing to say about someone. Jacob and Paul return and they're in good spirits with each other because they just like dog fought it out, I suppose. Literally no one cares that Paul wanted to kill Bella in that moment and lost his temper and shapeshifted. No one cares. Jacob tells the pack that Victoria is after Bella. So they decide to try to keep Bella in La Push as much as possible. She spends the day in La Push and goes home later. She thinks about Edward. I curled into a tight ball. No, Edward wasn't a killer. Even in his darker past, he'd never been a murderer of innocence at least. But what if he had been? What if during the time that I'd known him, he'd been just like any other vampire? What if people had been disappearing from the woods just like now? Would that have kept me away from him? I shook my head sadly. Love is irrational, I reminded myself. The more you love someone, the less sense anything made. What the hell is she blathering about? Like, okay, so if this dude who's really dreamy was actually murdering innocent humans, hikers in the woods, she would still love him. That's not unconditional. That's she's not with him for his personality or his qualities or traits. Because what quality would he have if he was a serial killer of innocence? Zero qualities. Stephanie Mayer, are you okay? This is not love. This is not uncondit- What are you talking about? The chapter ends with another dream. Change the channel, Mayer. Chapter 15. Pressure, like a drip, drip, drip that'll never stop. Bella spends her time at La Push. When Jacob dropped in to check on me, he apologised for ditching me so much. He told me his schedule wasn't always this crazy, but until Victoria was stopped, the wolves were on red alert. When we walked along the beach now, he always held my hand. What? This made me brood over what Jared had said about Jacob involving his girlfriend. I suppose that was exactly what it looked like from the outside. As long as Jake and I knew how it really was, I shouldn't let those kind of assumptions bother me. And maybe they wouldn't, if I hadn't known that Jacob would have loved for things to be the way they appeared. But his hand felt nice as it warmed mine, and I didn't protest. This is so World War me. Mike notices that Bella is spending all of her time with Jacob. Are you dating that kid from the push, the sophomore? He asked, poorly disguising the resentment in his tone. I shrugged, not in the technical sense of the word. I do spend most of my time with Jacob though. He's my best friend. Mike's eyes narrowed shrewdly. Don't kid yourself, Bella. The guy's head over heels for you. I know, I sighed. Life is complicated. <clears throat> and girls are cruel, Mike said under his breath. I agree with Mike in this instance, that Bella is just a big meanie. Jacob and Bella are talking about his wolfy traits, like Jacob being 108 degrees all the time. What fantastic superpower. Is it really bad, Jake? I asked anxiously, wishing I had some way to help him. Are you miserable? No, I'm not miserable, he told me. Not anymore. Not now that you know. That was hard before. He leaned over so that his cheek was resting on the top of my head. Why are they like cuddling like this? Stop. The best part, he said, suddenly smiling again, is the speed. Oh my God, they've got them hooked on amphetamines. It did mean something to me. I couldn't imagine that. The walls running faster than the vampire. When the Cullens ran, they all but turned invisible with speed. I can't imagine wolves the size of houses and horses running that fast either, but Maya has consistently had a problem with making her supernatural beings OP AF as flip. They discuss James trying to kill Bella and Edward sucking the venom out of Bella and then they discuss the Cullens. Bella spends her time at Billy's and then Emily's. Emily's only function in life is to look after the wolf men and feed them. It wasn't hard to be with her. After all, we were both wolf girls. Now I want to throw my laptop out the flipping mother flipping flipping i've got a ruddy gun flipping window we were both wolf girls now Ugh. bella's sole personality trait is being a groupie for supernatural beings bella freaks out over thinking about the cullens eventually i couldn't even walk anymore because i couldn't breathe i sat down on a patch of semi-dry rocks and curled up into a ball why has her heartbreak been written like she actually has ptsd this is not normal and it's boring to read her do nothing but mope around on a beach whilst all the other characters are off doing more interesting things. Jacob promises to take Bella cliff diving to cheer her up. Bella goes to Billy's to get Jacob, but he's not awake. Jacob is out hunting Victoria. You're right, he agreed, still complacent. His ancient eyes were impossible to read. This one's tricky. How old is Billy? 
Because I think Maya wanted to go for the mm -hmm, slightly outdated, wise old mystic brown person spiritual trope. But Jacob is 16, so Billy can't be over 100 because that's illegal. Why is his mum? Did they ever say? I don't know. Bella goes outside. A storm is brewing. This is a metaphor for how mad I'm getting at this book. Bella decides to go cliff diving anyway and hears Edward telling her to stop. She jumps, she's fine, then she gets caught up in the current and almost drowns. She hallucinates seeing Edward, but actually seeing him, and then she is truly happy. Goodbye, I love you, was my last thought. Maya, please don't tease me of a good time. Chapter 16, Paris. At that moment, my head broke the surface. Boo! Jacob has saved Bella because Bella can't do anything right, even drown. Bella froze up for a bit. His eyes were wet from the rain. Sure, the rain. What happened today? Did you find her? It was my turn to shudder, though I wasn't so cold here right next to his ridiculous body heat. Jacob shook his head. He was still more running than walking as he headed up the road to his house. No, she took off into the water. The bloodsuckers have the advantage there. That's why I raced home. I was afraid she was going to double back swimming. You spend so much time on the beach, he trailed off, a catch in his throat. Victoria could have easily have picked off Bella while she was in the water. We have the worst luck. No, no. When we got back, Em was waiting with the news. It's Harry Clearwater. Harry had a heart attack this morning. Yeah. Whilst Bella was off, sort of trying to drown herself, her dad's best mate had a heart attack. They go to Jacob's and fall asleep. Bella wakes up thinking about Romeo and Juliet because Maya is desperate to make Bella and Edward into Romeo and Juliet. Missing the point that even if it's not satire, right? Even if you don't believe that interpretation, they are still idiots who have no control and are very compulsive. They couldn't wait 10 minutes to make sure the other one was actually dead before choosing to off themselves as well. It's not this amazingly romantic story. They're both morons. Also, Juliet was literally 13 years old and Romeo wasn't that much older. So good job, Maya. Your characters have the same motivations and similarities as actual children. What if Paris had been Juliet's friend, her very best friend? What if he was the only person she could confide in about the whole devastating thing with Romeo? The one person who really understood her and made her feel halfway human again? What if he was patient and kind? What if he took care of her? What if Juliet knew she couldn't survive without him? What if he really loved her and wanted her to be happy? And what if she loved Paris? Not like Romeo, nothing like that, of course, but enough that she wanted him to be happy too. What rubbish is this? <laughs> Fuck that. I'm not in love with you, nor see you in that way, but I know that you're in love with me and I want you to be happy. So I'm considering being with you purely for that. Terrible thing to tell teen girls. People think it's romantic. I just, I never really got it. Uh, this isn't selfless, this is insanity. Also, if Bella and Jacob got together and had a kid, as it's told in Breaking Dawn, Jacob was really attracted to Bella's egg Tesco. all along, because it contained Renesme, which in itself doesn't make sense because Renesme is also half Edward's DNA, but you never see Jacob sniffing around Edward's marble ball sack, but okay. If Bella and Jacob had got together and had a kid together, would he have imprinted on his own child? I'm asking the real questions around here. <laughs> what would that do to Charlie? Harry's heart attack had pushed everything suddenly into perspective for me. Perspective that I didn't want to see because if I admitted to the truth of it, it would mean that I would have to change my ways. Could I live like that? It took someone else having a fatal heart attack for Bella to realize she's not the most important person in the world. Billy returns with the news that Harry has died and Jacob goes to pick up Bella's truck. It didn't take Jake long. The roar of my truck's engine broke the silence before I expected it. He helped me up from the couch without speaking, keeping his arm around my shoulder when the cold air outside made me shiver. He took the driver's seat without asking and then pulled me next to his side to keep his arm tight around me. I leaned my head against his chest. Oh yes, very friendly and platonic behavior from Bella's side. I couldn't imagine my life without Jacob now. I cringed away from the idea of even trying to imagine that. Somehow he'd become essential to my survival, but to leave things the way they were, was that cruel as Mike had accused? Yes. I remembered wishing that Jacob were my brother. I realized now that all I really wanted was a claim on him. It didn't feel brotherly when he held me like this. It just felt nice, warm and comforting and familiar, safe. Jacob was a safe harbor. I could stake a claim. 
I had that much within my power. What the hell is she talking about? What the flip? I would have to commit to this. Commit as much of me as there was left. Every one of the broken pieces. It was the only way to be fair to him. Would I? Could I? How is it even fair to him? Would it be so wrong to make Jacob happy? Even if the love I felt for him was no more than a weak echo of what I was capable of. Even if my heart was far away, wandering, grieving after my fickle Romeo. Would it be so very wrong? She literally wants to use him to get into a relationship with him just so that she can grow up and do things with her life and stop moping around, using him as a literal crutch to do that. If you've decided to be in a relationship, a romantic relationship with someone, that love needs to be real for, for it to work, right? What's going on? Wouldn't Edward, indifferent as he might be, want me to be as happy as was possible under the circumstances? Wouldn't enough friendly emotion linger for him to want that for me? I thought he would. He wouldn't begrudge me this, giving just a small bit of the love he didn't want to my friend Jacob. After all, it wasn't the same love at all. Jacob pressed his warm cheek against the top of my hair. If I turned my face to the side, if I pressed my lips against his bare shoulder, I knew without any doubt exactly what would follow. It would be very easy. There'd be no need for explanations tonight. But could I do it? Could I betray my absent heart to save my pathetic life? This is beyond pathetic now. She thinks that she can't live without Jacob, so she's willing to get with him and be with him in a romantic sense, even though she doesn't fancy him, just so he will stick around so she can heal. She is leading him on. Before she can kiss him, Jacob smells a vampire. He freaks out, but Bella sees a car, a Mercedes S55 AMG. Bella knows it's Carlisle's car. Jacob continues freaking out and storms off. Bye, Bella, he called back over his shoulder. I really hope you don't die. He sprinted into the darkness, shaking so hard that his shape seemed blurred. He disappeared before I could open my mouth to call him back. Based. Bella realises that she did see Victoria at the beach. She'd been right there, right there in the harbour with me and Jacob. If Sam hadn't been there, if it had just been the two of us, I couldn't breathe or move. God, we could only dream. Chapter 17. Visitor. The vampire is Alice. I locked my arms around her, gasping to inhale as much of the scent of her skin as possible. It wasn't like anything else, not floral or spice, citrus or musk. No perfume in the world could compare. My memory hadn't done it justice. Bella is a freak. Bella starts crying, so Alice cuddles her. Alice had a vision of Bella jumping and thought she had died. Alice shook her head. I told him this would happen, but he didn't believe me. Bella promised, her voice imitated his so perfectly that I froze in shock while the pain ripped from my torso. Don't be looking for her future either, she continued to quote him. We've done enough damage. Even when he's not in the story, he still manages to be a massive control freak. Bella tries to convince Alice that she was cliff diving for fun. Alice didn't see Jacob pull Bella out. Bella decides to tell Alice that Jacob is a werewolf, like straight up tells her straight away because her only loyalty in life is to the Cullens no matter how badly they drop her. Alice says that Bella smells awful from the werewolves. Alice immediately starts being racist. She glowered at me. A young werewolf? Even worse. Edward was right. You're a magnet for danger. Weren't you supposed to be staying out of trouble? There's nothing wrong with werewolves, I grumbled, stung by her critical tone. Jacob has never tried to eat Bella, unlike your boyfriend, Alice. Bella tells Alice about how the pack have been protecting her against Victoria. Alice scowled at the floor for a moment. Well, I guess I acted impulsively today. I probably shouldn't have intruded. I could feel the blood draining from my face. My stomach drops. Don't go, Alice, I whispered. My fingers locked around the collar of her white shirt and I began to hyperventilate. Please don't leave me. Christ, just exchange numbers or emails and stay in touch. Who cares about what Edward thinks? Charlie, I answered the phone. No, it's me, Jacob said. Jake, Alice scrutinised my expression. I'm just making sure you're still alive, Jacob said sourly. I'm fine. I told you that it wasn't. Yeah, I got it. Bye. Or drama. Alice squeezed my hand. They aren't excited I'm here. Not especially, but it's none of their business anyway. Sam and his gang have been out there busting their asses and risking their lives to keep Bella safe and her loyalty immediately switches back to the Cullens after they ditched her entirely just because Edward had a tantrum. Bella is the worst. Also, the current werewolves only exist because of the vampires, because of the threat that the vampires are to them. Werewolves do not eat humans, vampires do. It is 100% their business if the Cullens are back because they just want to keep people safe. I'm team werewolf on this. Alice leaves to hunt and get clothes but comes back. Charlie gets home and is sad about Harry. 
Bella falls asleep on the sofa but awakens and hears Charlie and Alice talking about her. I've never felt so helpless, Charlie began slowly. I didn't know what to think. The first week, I thought I was going to have to hospitalise her. She wouldn't eat or drink. She wouldn't move. Dr. Garandi was throwing around words like catatonic, but I didn't let him up to see her. I was afraid it would scare her. She went back to school and work. She ate and slept and did her homework. She answered when someone asked her a direct question, but she was empty. Her eyes were blank. There were lots of little things. She wouldn't listen to music anymore. I found a bunch of CDs broken in the trash. She didn't read. She wouldn't be in the same room when the TV was on. Not that she watched it much before. I finally figured it out. She was avoiding everything that may might remind her of him. I have zero sympathy or patience for her. We've never seen their relationship be good. It was stupid in the first book. It was just annoying. We're told at the beginning of the second book that Bella had this perfect summer with Edward, but there's no anecdotes or recaps of it. We're just told and so must believe her. I don't believe her, so I don't care about her heartbreak. She seems better now though. Yeah, ever since she started hanging out with Jacob Black, I've noticed a real improvement. She has some colour in her cheeks when she comes home, some light in her eyes. She's happier, he paused. His voice was different when he spoke again. He's a year or so younger than her, and I know that she used to think of him as a friend, but I think maybe it's something more now, or headed in that direction anyway. Charlie said this in a tone that was almost belligerent. It was a warning, not for Alice, but for her to pass along. Jacob's old for his years, he continued, still sounding defensive. He's taken care of his father physically the way Bella took care of her mother emotionally. It matured him. He's a good looking kid too. Takes after his mother's side. He's good for Bella, you know, Charlie insisted. Then it's good she has him, Alice agreed. Charlie, why don't you just go and marry Jacob? Charlie went on in a hopeless tone. I don't know if she's going to get over it. I'm not sure if it's in her nature to heal from something like this. She's always been such a constant little thing. She doesn't get past things, change her mind. She's one of a kind, Alice agreed in a dry voice. Why does that sound sarcastic on Alice's end? He's not coming back to visit too, is he? I could hear the suppressed anger in Charlie's voice. That's something at least, Charlie snorted. Well, I hope he's enjoying himself. For the first time, Alice's voice had a bit of steel in it. I wouldn't make assumptions, Charlie. I knew how her eyes would flash when she used that tone. Charlie is a parent who has seen his daughter lose all personality over some dude, so it's completely normal for him to hate Edward. Even without that, Edward is a git. Bella pretends to wake up and spends the day with Alice. Alice had found the asylum she was committed to as a human. This is a more interesting story than New Moon. I was grateful. It was enough to listen to the stories of the family I'd once dreamt of belonging to. Yeah, well, you aren't even good to the family you have now, so never mind any of that. Charlie heads off for the funeral. Bella cleans whilst Alice lounges around and talks. Excuse me. Alice has super speed. She could tidy the house in 10 minutes flat, easy. And that's the least she could do for Ghost and Bella. Alice can't see the werewolves in her visions and Jacob turns up. You don't have to go anywhere, Alice. You were here first. She laughed her silvery little laugh. It had a dark edge. Trust me, it wouldn't be a good idea to have me and Jacob black in a room together. Bella is the worst. Jacob helped her through her dark days. And here she is ditching him for a vampire. Also, what is Alice's damage? She's not even trying to be nice. Jacob is literally just existing. He's not done anything to her. So and she's, she's the way older and way more mature, one out of the two. Why is she getting bent out of shape? Chapter 18, the funeral. Jacob's rabbit. When they call it that, I'm not thinking of a car. Idled by the curb with, Jer with Jared behind the wheel and Embry in the passenger seat. I understood what this meant. They were afraid to let him come here alone. It made me sad and a little annoyed. The Cullens weren't like that. How are the werewolves meant to know that? They just know the vampires are their mortal enemies. How are they meant to know, huh? Jacob goes into the house to talk to Bella and he is being moody. If we didn't have Bella's perspective, we would think that he's just a jerk. But we do have Bella's perspective. So we know that Bella is fully ready to be like, Jacob who, sorry? If it means the Cullens would go back. And only a day before she was considering entering a relationship with him to use him to start living a life again. Let's be real, for all her talk of, oh, I love Jacob so much, he's my bestie, hee <laughs> hee, she really doesn't give that much of a shit about him in comparison to her precious Cullens. Are the rest of them coming back now? He asked in a cool, quiet voice. It reminded me of Sam's always calm manner. Jacob was becoming more like Sam. I wondered why that bothered me so much. Because you're a control freak. What a disaster. How could I have alienated him so completely in such a short amount of time? Would he forgive me when Alice was gone? What if he didn't? So what if he doesn't? Learn to get on with humans. Stop relying on one person to live your life via. Leave Jacob alone. Bella is crying, so Jacob feels bad. Can't I be friends with both of you at the same time? I asked, my voice not hiding an ounce of the hurt I felt. He shook his head slowly. No, I don't think you can. No, I don't think I will. I sniffed and stared at his big feet. Okay. 
But you'll wait, right? You'll still be my friends, even though I love Alice too. I didn't look up, afraid to see what he think of that last part. It took him a minute to answer. So I was probably right not to look. Yeah, I'll always be your friend, he said gruffly, no matter who you love. Ugh. They hug for like ages. Very platonic. Jacob is all, I can't be around when Alice is around because I might kill her. Okay. Jacob freed one arm so he could cup his big brown hand under my chin and make me look at him. Yeah, it was easier when we were both human, wasn't it? I sighed. We stared at each other for a long moment. His hand smouldered against my skin. In my face, I knew there was nothing but wistful sadness. I didn't want to have to say goodbye now, no matter for how short a time. At first, his face reflected not mine, but then, as neither of us looked away, his expression changed. Oh, God. He released me, lifting his other hand to brush his fingertips along my cheek, trailing them down to my jaw. I could feel his fingers tremble, not with anger this time. He pressed his palm against my cheek so that my face was trapped between his burning hands. Bella, he whispered. I was frozen. Stop. No, I hadn't made this decision yet. I didn't know if I could do this and now I was out of time to think, but I would have been a fool if I thought rejecting him now would have no consequences. I stared back at him. He was not my Jacob, but he could be. His face was familiar and beloved. In so many real ways, I did love him. He was my comfort, my safe harbour. Right now, I could choose to have him belong to me. Hate. Alice was back for the moment, but that changed nothing. True love was forever lost. The prince was never coming back to kiss me away from my enchanted sleep. I was not a princess after all. So what was the fairy tale protocol for other kisses? The mundane kind that didn't break any spells. Get out. Maybe it would be easy, like holding his hand or having his arms around me. Maybe it would feel nice. Maybe it wouldn't feel like a betrayal. Besides, who was I betraying anyway? Just myself. Keeping his eyes on mine, Jacob began to bend his face toward me and I was still absolutely undecided. May I stop? Anyway, the house phone rings, so Jacob answers it. Sorry, how rude? It's not your house? What the hell? This is the start of his asshole arc. I recovered myself and held out my hand for the phone. Jacob ignored me. He's not here, Jacob said. The words were menacing. There was some very short reply, a request for more information, it seemed, because he added unwillingly, he's at the funeral. Then Jacob hung up the phone. Filthy bloodsucker, he muttered under his breath. The face he turned back to me was the bitter mask again. Who did you just hang up on? I gasped, infuriated. In my house and on my phone. This is the only time that I'll ever agree with Bella because that is so rude and weird. Jacob thinks it was Carlisle on the phone and then he tries to leave, but Alice is there having a vision about Edward. Jacob's furious voice was suddenly in my ear, hissing out a stream of profanities. I felt a vague disapproval. His new friends were clearly a bad influence. Get lost, holy crow. If all the Cullens swore, then Bella would turn into a sailor. Bella freaks out uselessly, as usual. And Alice calls Rosalie. It pisses Alice off. Jacob tells Alice about the phone call of Carlisle. Alice realises it was Edward on the phone and now Edward thinks Bella is dead. I don't care about any of this. Rosalie told him I killed myself, didn't she? I said, sighing as I relaxed. Yes, Alice admitted, her eyes flashing hard again. In her defence, she did believe it. They rely on my sight far too much for something that works so imperfectly. But for her to track him down to tell him this, didn't she realise or care? Her voice faded away in horror. You know that Rosalie went to Edward just to like gloat about it, right? Because she's never liked Bella. So she's gloating like, tee hee, she's dead now. Come back to the family home. Bella realises Edward is off to have the Volturi finish him. No, the half shriek denial was so loud after the whispered words, it made us all jump. I felt the blood rushing to my face as I realised what I, she'd seen. No, 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 he can't, he can't do that. He made up his mind as soon as your friend confirmed that it was too late to save you. But he, he left. He didn't want me anymore. What difference does it make now? He knew I would die sometime. This is probably the most emotion she's shown in the entire book, but I don't care about Edward. Alice saw Edward asking the Volturi to kill him, but she's not sure they will because Aro likes Carlisle and wouldn't want to annoy him. So if they agree to grant his favour, we're too late. If they say no and he comes up with a plan to offend them quickly enough, we're too late. If he gives in to his more theatrical tendencies, we might have time. Even Alice knows that Edward is melodramatic AF as flip. Jacob promises not to let anything happen to Charlie and Bella writes Charlie a note. Dad, I wrote, I'm with Alice. Edward's in trouble. You can ground me when I get back. I know it's a bad time, so sorry. Love you so much, Bella. He's at his best mate's funeral. She's doing a runner out of the country to save a glittering moron. Jacob doesn't want Bella to go. Bella grabs her passport and Alice and Jacob start arguing. You might control yourself on occasion, but these leeches you're taking her to. Jacob was furiously accusing her. Yes, you're right, dog. Alice was snarling too. 
The Volturi are the very essence of our kind. They're the reason your hair stands on end when you smell me. They're the substance of your nightmares, the dread behind your instincts. I'm not unaware of that. Why is Alice talking like this? She is not Bram Stoker. Jacob caught my arm with a shivering hand. Please, Bella, I'm begging. His dark eyes were glistening with tears. A lump filled my throat. Jake, I have to. You don't though, you really don't. You could stay here with me. You could stay alive for Charlie, for me. Ah yeah, that's right. Forget Jacob, Charlie, Renee, anyone else that might remotely care about Bella. No, she needs to go to potentially die for someone who ditched her in the woods. Lol. Bella leaves anyway, rip. Chapter 19, race. Bella and Alice are on a plane to Italy. Alice rings Jasper. I can't be sure. I keep seeing him do different things. He keeps changing his mind. A killing spree through the city. Attacking the guard, lifting a car over his head in the main square. Mostly things that would expose him. He knows that's the fastest way to force a reaction. So let me get this straight. Edward wants to die. So he thinks murdering loads of innocent humans would force the Volturi's hand. Which of course it would. But one of his thoughts was what if I just straight up murdered a bunch of innocent humans to show that I'm a vampire. Why is this never discussed how much of a piece of shit Edward is? It's a blink and you'll miss it moment. I didn't notice that upon reading it like the first two times or so. There's some exposition about the Volturi. They're over 3000 years old. They enforce the rules that vampires must keep their existence a secret. I've already explained in my first video why I think this is dumb. Seeing as all these vampires are so overpowered, it doesn't matter if people know like if they exist or not because humans aren't gonna be able to do anything. You could probably nuke a vampire and they'd probably be all right. So go back to the first video if you want to hear more of my reasoning behind this. And the Volturi will get us if we mess up. Alice stiffened. You say that, it's like it's a good thing. I shrugged. Knock it off, Bella, or we're turning around in New York and going back to Forks. What? You know what? If we're too late for Edward, I'm going to do my damnedest to get you back to Charlie and I don't want any trouble from you. Do you understand that? At least Alice is sick of her shit too. I couldn't anticipate anything either. Maybe if I were very, very, very lucky, I'd somehow be able to save Edward. But I wasn't so stupid as to think that saving him would mean that I could stay with him. I was no different, no more special than I'd been before. There would be no new reason for him to want me now. Seeing him and losing him again. I fought back against the pain. This was the price I had to pay to save his life. I would pay it. She is risking her life for someone she thinks doesn't even like her. I wouldn't even bother getting off the sofa for Edward. I wouldn't even get off this chair if he was glittering a glittery death over there. Wouldn't do it. They get to New York and then they get on another plane. Instead of dwelling on the terrifying possibilities that no matter what Alice said, I did not intend to survive, I concentrated on lesser problems. Sure, Maya, keep telling me that Bella isn't suicidal or having suicidal ideation. Alice has a vision that the Volturi will tell Edward no because his gift is too useful and they want him to join them instead. Alice, what? I'm confused. How are you seeing this so clearly? And then other times you see things far away, things that don't happen because plot convenience. Actually, Bella, she hesitated and then seemed to make a choice. Honestly, I think it's all gotten beyond ridiculous. I'm debating whether she's just change you myself. Why is Alice the only person around here that gets shit done? Good point. But at least I had something to hope for if we did. If Alice made good on her promise and she didn't kill me, then Edward could run after his distractions all he wanted and I could follow. I wouldn't let him be distracted. Maybe when I was beautiful and strong, he wouldn't want to... Sh oh, this is so weak. This is literally so weak. This is pathetic. This is the most like anti-feminist garbage. <sighs> she is such a freak. Why would you become a vampire and then just mope after some dude? Why would you not go off being like an awesome vampire instead? I hate this book. Bella naps and then Alice wakes her up and tells her the Volturi told Edward no, but he freaked out. There was a bad hour, she whispered. He decided to go hunting. Like, just go eat humans. She looked at me, seeing the incomprehension in my face. In the city, she explained, it got very close. He changed his mind at the last minute. He wouldn't want to disappoint Carlisle, I mumbled, not at the end. Yeah, never mind, like, an actual innocent human. What is with Edward having these tantrums and deciding to maybe kill humans because of it before change of his mind? He is literally way more dangerous for Bella to be around than the pack of werewolves. Edward has decided that instead of killing humans, he will walk out into the sun so everyone can see him for the sparkly monster he is. Though, right at the time of this happening, there's a big festival going on during this. So wouldn't you just assume that it's just some dude covered in glitter? Some plan, genius. Also, why would humans see a glittery person and automatically think vampire? Because that's not a thing in this universe, nor our universe. It's not vampire law or canon that they sparkle. 
So why would that make someone be like, oh my God, Inhuman Monster, Vampire, Vampire? This is stupid. It doesn't make any sense. They get to Italy and Alice steals a Porsche. As they head towards the city, they notice the festival going on. Why didn't Alice notice this in her vision? Their plan is to have Edward see Bella before he walks into the sunlight. That is it. That is the climax of this book. 500 odd pages for that. For someone to walk in the, in the light and someone else to see them. God, it's dull. Try not to trip, she added. We don't have time for a concussion today. I groaned. That would be just like me. Ruin everything, destroy the world in a moment of klutziness. <laughs> so quirky, tee hee. Just like me, how silly I am. Also, Edward, he's not the world. He's not that important, babes. Chapter 20, Volterra. Oh God, what time did I start this? Because it's quarter to two. I've got a minion at 9.30. Oh well, it's dedication. To the cro We're going to get through this. We are five chapters from the end. We're going to smash this out tonight. They're caught in traffic in the city. Alice bribes one of the guards to let them in. Alice tells Bella to go and I shoved a heavy woman out of my way. <laughs> Body shaming in my Christian novel. She runs for a crowd of people and for a fountain. This whole time she's screaming his name. I find it hard to believe he hasn't already caught her scent which stands out to him above all the others, nor heard her with his super hearing, nor heard the minds of the people around him probably calling her an idiot in Italian. And I'm sure he can speak Italian because he's just so smart and perfect like that. This is very dramatic and it's very forced and annoying. I could see him now and I could see that he could not see me. It was really him, no hallucination this time. And I realized that my delusions were more flawed than I'd realized. They never done him justice. Please be quiet, shush, shush. I'd never seen anything more, be oh my God. I'd never seen anything more beautiful. Even as I ran, gasping and screaming, I could appreciate that. And the last seven months meant nothing. And his words in the forest meant nothing. And it did not matter if he did not want me. I would never want anything but him, no matter how long I lived. This is not romance, Maya. This is, this is simpery and it's pathetic. His mean words and him ditching me in the woods to possibly die means nothing because, ooh, look how pretty he is. That is not a good basis for a relationship, Maya. Anyway, she crashes into him and he's like, well, Carla was right. That's not how he sounds. Imagine Ron Paz. Imagine like between Ron Paz on the screen and he's just like, you're like a drug to me, Bella. <laughs> I'm so stupid. It was very strange for I knew we were both in mortal danger. Still in that instant, I felt well, whole. I could feel my heart racing in my chest, the blood pulsing hot and fast through my veins again. My lungs filled deep with the sweet scent that came off his skin. It was like there had never been any hole in my chest. I was perfect, not healed, but as if there'd been no wound in the first place. Because of course, how can you, a woman, not be complete without having an emotionally abusive and controlling man around? Of course. I can't believe how quick it was. I didn't feel a thing. They're very good, he mused, closing his eyes again and pressing his lips to my hair. His voice was like honey and velvet. Death, that's half sucked death that hath sucked the honey of thy breath hath no power yet upon thy beauty he i hate him so much he murmured and i recognized the line spoken by romeo in the tomb the clock boomed out its final chime you smell just exactly the same as always he went on so maybe this is hell i don't care i'll take it I can't believe that he's just really reciting Romeo and Juliet to her right there. If I was the Volturi, I'd endgame him right now for this pathetic display. Edward realises he isn't dead, but two of the Volturi's goons show up to tell him off. Felix and Dimitri. I don't care. Alice also turns up. Still don't care. Someone else turns up. At first I thought it was a young boy. The newcomer was as tiny as Alice with lank pale brown hair trimmed short. The body under the cloak, which was darker, almost black, was slim and androgynous, but the face was too pretty for a boy. The wide-eyed, full-lipped face would make a Botticelli angel look like a gargoyle, and even, al even allowing for the dull crimson irises. What is with these vampires that are basically just children? Her name is Jane. They decide to walk with her. It's a long story. Alice's eyes flickered towards me in a way. In summary, she did jump off a cliff, but she wasn't trying to kill herself. Bella's all about the extreme sports these days. I flushed and turned my eyes straight ahead, looking after the dark shadow that I could no longer see. I could imagine what he was hearing in Alice's thoughts right now. Near drowning, stalking vampires, werewolf friends. Hmm, Edward said curtly, and the casual tone of his voice was gone. He's been back for five minutes, and he already wants to start bossing Bella around and controlling her again. 
Maya keeps calling Jane, through Bella obviously, the little one, which is very infantilizing for a vampire who is enormously powerful. But seeing as her and Alice are the same size, what are we to infer from this? That Jasper's PC should be investigated? They go into the drains through a tunnel and into a room. Chapter 21, verdict. They are in some posh Tory room. There's a human lady at reception. There's another vampire called Alec. Alec basically calls Bella Butters. I'm not paraphrasing, this is just what happens, all right? This is the way I see it. They go to another chamber. There's a bunch of vampires chilling. And then there's a really old vampire. He glided to Jane, took her face in his papery hands, kissed her lightly on her full lips, then floated back a step. Nonce. This vampire is happy to see Edward, Alice and Bella. His name is Aro. Oh good, another one of Maya's outrageously OP and stupid vampiric powers. And also exponentially more powerful, Edward added dryly. He looked at Alice as he swiftly explained. Aro needs physical contact to hear your thoughts, but he hears much more than I do. You know I can only hear what's passing through your head in the moment. Aro hears every thought your mind has ever had. I'm just gonna read from my script for this, right? Cause I wrote a mouthful. The average person has between 12,000 to 80,000 thoughts per day. Let's round that off, making an average of 50,000 thoughts a day. That's 18 million thoughts per year. And I doubt Aro is reading the minds of children. So let's give a median age of say 25. And that's 455 million thoughts to hear in a matter of however long he stays physically touching you for. So say like five to 10 minutes. That is impossibly stupid. And when you factor in how most thoughts are utterly mundane, that is just a massive waste of time. Twilight vampire powers are incomprehensibly useless. I just did more research for this book in one paragraph than Maya did for the entire series. Maya's tendency to exaggerate powers Alice getting visions over mundane crap seemingly constantly, which would make it difficult for her to go about her day normally, or all the vampires having ridiculous strength and speed is annoying. What actual use is there for Arrow to know all the thoughts you've ever had? It's complete information overload. There is no way he could sift through millions of thoughts in one go. I'm triggered by how OP this is. I think Maya just goes, hmm, what would sound cool? And then runs with it even when it's completely impractical and nonsensical and just daft. Two more old ass vampires turn up, Marcus and Caius. The dark haired man seemed utterly bored. This guy is my spirit animal. Maya keeps repeating the words papery skin and it makes me feel sick. <laughs> I'm just imagining the old guy being like dusty, like shakes and dust is coming off him and you can see it, it's just gross, I hate it. Aro was shaking his head. Amazing, he said, absolutely amazing. Alice's expression was frustrated. Edward turned to her and explained again in a swift, low voice. Marcus sees relationships. He's surprised by the intensity of ours. That is another, what do you mean sees relationships? What do you mean? Ooh, that guy flipped that girl. Ooh, he doesn't like him because he forgot to get him a present 10 years ago. Ooh, all right. Aro laughed. If I hadn't smelled her through your memories, I wouldn't have had believed the call of anyone's blood could be so strong. I've never felt anything like it myself. Most of us would trade much for such a gift and yet you. Yeah, Bella is that special that her blood is the most amazingest ever. Considering these dudes are all like 3000 years old, they smelled a lot of blood in their time, right? It's boring. Aro wants to see if his ability will work on Bella. It doesn't. Aro wants to know if Jane's ability will work on Bella. Edward moves to attack Jane, but then he's on the ground being tortured by Jane's mind. It is the least he deserves. Jane tries on Bella, but she's fine. This is because Bella is a complete blockhead. She's not got a skull shield in her brain. She's got just thick concrete. Aro asks the trio to join their clan, even Bella. Guys, surely you see the potential, Aro chided him affectionately. I haven't seen a prospective time since we found Jane and Alec. Can you imagine the possibilities when she is one of us? What, because she's an egghead? Because she's got a complete block for a brain? What do you mean? Kaya says all, the law claims them, the human girl knows too much. And Edward is like, the humans who also work for you know what's up. Yes, he agreed. But when they're no longer useful to us, they will serve to sustain us. That is not your plan for this one. If she betrays our secrets, are you prepared to destroy her? I think not, he scoffed. That sounds like a shit deal. Work for these vampires and they might eat you. Aro was like, Edward, just give her the damn venom already. 
Shinji just getting the flipping robot already. But Alice steps forward to give her thoughts to Arrow and implies that Bella will definitely become a vampire. And would it really matter that Alice was willing? Would it make any difference if I did become a vampire when the idea was so repulsive to Edward? If death was to him a better alternative than having me around forever and a mortal annoyance, terrified as I was, I felt myself sinking down into depression, drowning in it. Oh my God, shut up, please, shut up. The vampires say that they will visit to make sure Bella gets changed and then they get kicked out. I stared at her frightened, but she only seemed chagrined. Oh God. It was then that I first heard the babble of voices, loud, rough voices coming from the antechamber. Well, this is unusual. A man's coarse voice boomed. So medieval, an unpleasantly shrill female voice gushed back. A large crowd was coming through the little door, filling the smaller stone chamber. Dimitri motioned for us to make room. We pressed back against the cold wall to let them pass. The rest of them, maybe 40 or more, filed in after the couple. Some studied the setting like tourists. A few even snapped pictures. Others looked confused, as if the story that had led them to this room was not making sense anymore. I noticed one small dark woman in particular. Around her neck was a rosary, and she gripped the cross tightly in one hand. She walked more slowly than the others, touching someone now and then and asking a question in unfamiliar language. No one seemed to understand her, and her voice grew more panicked. Edward pulled my face against this chest, but it was too late. I already understood. This group of people is the Volturi's dinner. There is a random vampire called Heidi. She was dressed to emphasise that beauty. Her amazingly long legs, darkened with tights, were exposed by the shortest of mini skirts. Ooh. Her top was long sleeved and high necked, but extremely close fitting and constructed of red vinyl. Her long mahogany hair was lustrous and her eyes were the strangest shade of violet, a colour that might result from blue tinted contacts over red irises. Why is Bella simping for some random vampire? The chapter ends with screams from the Taurus. Isn't this impractical? 40 tourists going missing from a city. Tourists with dozens or culminatively hundreds, if not thousands of families, friends, acquaintances, work colleagues back home. Wouldn't this type of feeding have to be a regular occurrence for these vampires as well? So if like regularly, like at least once, maybe more than that, because they have to feed quite regularly, don't they? So say once every, say bi-weekly, once every two weeks, a big group of tourists is just going missing from this city. How would there not be investigations all over the city, like coming from all different corners of the world, because these are tourists, right? Over these tourists constantly disappearing. How would there not be mass investigations and the city be locked down? Word would also spread that, hey, if you go to this city, uh, once every few weeks, big groups of people just disappear. And that would drive down and lessen the actual tourism itself if it was known as this hot spot for disappearances. Like, because people would think it's murders or kidnappings, right? I don't think Mayer has thought about these books as much as I have. Chapter 22, Flight. Bella goes into hysterics. And I suppose, for once, begrudgingly, that is fair. Bella can't believe the human receptionist is okay with all the murder taking place just because the receptionist wants to ultimately become a vampire. Which, oh, I don't know, you're all right with Edward flipping out and wanting to murder people just because he's having a tantrum. Bella is still worried that her time with Edward is finite. Here in his arms, it was so easy to fantasise that he wanted me. I didn't want to think about his motivations now, about whether he acted this way to keep me calm while we were in danger, or if he just felt guilty for where we were and relieved that he wasn't responsible for my death. Maybe the time part had been enough that I didn't bore him for the moment, but it didn't matter. I was so much happier pretending. You need to go to that shrink, babe, and work on your self-esteem. They are free to leave, so Alice finds a car to steal. Alice was apologetic. I'm sorry, she gestured vaguely towards the dashboard. There wasn't much to choose from. It's fine, Alice, he grinned. They can't all be 911 turbos. She sighed. I may have to acquire one of those legally. It was fabulous. I'll get you one for Christmas, Edward promised. Pfft, 0 0.1 percenters. They get to the airport and Bella refuses to sleep so she can spend more time with Edward. She orders a Coke on the plane. Bella, Edward said disapprovingly. He knew my low tolerance for caffeine. You know, in that, the first book, after they have that encounter with that gang who wanted to... Mm, Bella. Didn't she have two Cokes at that restaurant? And she was fine. No mention of it then. Can't trick me, Maya. I actually pay attention. I pay more attention to your books than you do. The way my brain can just pick up really stupid details is incredible and also infuriating. In the Demon Arter series by Darren Shan, in the first one... Dervish's sort of kind of girlfriend. I think her name's Mira Flame. She's described as having blonde hair. She gets off this bike, takes off a hat. I've not read this in way over a like, minimum a decade. Takes off her helmet, blonde hair like tumbles out. And then in a later book, 
she's described as having red hair and no mention of her dying it. Like a much later, like book seven or so, seven or so. This mind, imagine if I applied that sort of memory to anything else. So they don't even talk to each other for the whole flight. They just touch each other's faces in a very Mormon manner. I don't want the Mormon or Christian community to come for me. I'm just making fun of Maya. And if you're bothered that I'm making fun of Maya's religion, then I guess you just have to forgive me. Because it's what the big JC, the big Joshua Christ would want, right? They get to Atlanta and Jasper greets them. Carlisle and Esme are also there. Oh great, the whole annoying gang is here. Thank you, Bella, Carlisle said. We owe you. Pfft, I'll bet. After upheaving your entire life and ghosting her because Edward had a tantrum. Rosalie and Emmett are also there. Don't, e Esme whispered. She feels awful. I doubt it. She clearly wanted to gloat that Bella had died. She doesn't give one shit about Bella. Edward glowered at the absurdly lovely blonde vampire waiting for us. Please, Edward, I said. I didn't want to ride with Rosalie any more than he seemed to, but I'd caused more than enough discord in his family. What is this insistence of Bella blaming herself for everything? These are mature vampires who are so much like decades and hundreds of years older than her. They are in charge of their own poor decision making, right? Rosalie's the one who wanted to be a bitch. I'm so very sorry, Bella. I felt wretched about every part of this and so grateful that you were brave enough to go save my brother after what I did. Please say you'll forgive me. The words were awkward, stilted because of her embarrassment, but they seemed sincere. Of course, Rosalie, I mumbled, grasping at any chance to make her hate me a little less. Oh, so pathetic. It's not your fault at all. I'm the one who jumped off the damn cliff. Of course I forgive you. I hate Bella. What is this insistence in like novels on making main characters so soft all the time that they automatically forgive everyone for their bullshit transgressions when other people have actually done stuff that is wrong? I've noticed that this is a thing in fiction and I don't like it. I don't think it's relatable. That's why I don't like it. When I'm righteously mad at someone, like righteously, and they give me some sort of like half-hearted apology, I don't accept it. Make them sweat. Make them sweat. It's a toxic trait, but... It's better than being walked all over by everyone all the time, all right? And just because like someone says sorry, you don't have to accept their apologies either. You can be like, oh, I reject that apology. <laughs> I, like to, I like to use that word every now and then. <laughs> yeah, sorry, are you? Well, I don't forgive you. I want in a few days time, but as I said, don't come for me. That is my toxic trait. Rosalie told Edward Bella was dead to gloat and to get him to stop moping around. She hates Bella. She probably loved hearing the news. So why is Bella accepting this apology? Just make her feel bad for a bit. She almost like, you know, her actions caused a chain reaction. Her brother almost died. When people are being assholes, make them know that they're being assholes. Bella falls asleep because that is all she's good at. And then, and then I heard Charlie. Bella, he shouted from some distance. Charlie, I mumbled, trying to shake off the stupor. Stupor. I don't know. Shh, Edward whispered. It's okay, you're home and safe. Just sleep. I can't believe you have the nerve to show your face here. Charlie bellowed at Edward, his voice much closer now. Stop it, Dad. I groaned. He didn't hear me. What's wrong with her? Charlie demanded. She's just very ch tired, Charlie, Edward assured him quietly. Please let her rest. Don't tell me what to do. Legend. Give her to me. Get your hands off of her. Edward tried to pass me to Charlie, but I clung to him with locked, tenacious fingers. I could feel my dad yanking on my arm. Cut it out, Dad, I said with more volume. I managed to drag my lids back to stare at Charlie with bleary eyes. Be mad at me. Charlie has every single right to be mad with both of them. Bella runs away when he's at his best mate's funeral, then shows up back home with the guy that caused so much emotional damage that she was described as catatonic. Honestly, from his perspective, well, from like any... In fact, it's worse from our perspective because we know that he fully just ditched her in a forest. But he would be a bad dad if he wasn't mad at this dude. Bella, however, just expects Charlie to like get the hell over it. Dad, it wasn't a big deal that he left me in the forest to almost die. Our love is true. The gaslighting of Charlie Swan is real. Chapter 23, the truth. Bella is dreaming again and then Edward wakes her up. Maya, however, insists on letting Bella tell us that, oh my God, it must just be a really good hallucination. He's an angel. It can't possibly be real. For several pages. We already know that it's the real Edward. This is, it's such a waste of our time. It's such a waste of our time. I slowly realized that Edward really, truly was here with me and I was wasting time being an idiot. It's like, she heard me. Edward frowned, sleeping. You should probably know that I'm breaking the rules right now. Well, not technically, since he said I was never to walk through his door again and I came in the window, but still, the intent was clear. 
Charlie banned for you from the house? I asked, disbelief quickly melting into fury. I hate her. His eyes were sad. Did you expect anything else? My eyes were mad. I was going to have to have a few words with my father. Wait till my father hears about this. Perhaps it would be a good time to remind him that I was over the legal age of adulthood. Yeah, well, flipping act like it then. Act like it. Stop moping around, being ridiculous all the time. Act, don't throw yourself off a cliff to hallucinate seeing your stupid boyfriend. You stupid... How did people root for this character? How did people actually like Bella Swan? It didn't matter so much, of course, except in principle. All too soon, there'll be no reason for the prohibition. I turned my thoughts to less painful avenues. I wrote here, not to be rude or anything, but is Bella actually on crack? <laughs> is Maya aware that we've read the story up until this far and can also go back and read it again to see how devoid of life Bella became after Edward dumped her? Because remember, like, he dumped her being like, no, I don't want you, and uh, I'm going to be swarming in vampiric pussy. I'm going to be so distracted. Where, hey, la, la, la. I don't really want you. I'm bored. We can go back and read that and read like how just awful it was. And also read how Charlie had to be there and try to pick up the pieces. She is willing to throw every human relationship he, she has away whenever Edward is back on the scene. I'm assuming we're meant to be on Bella's side for this little run, but she is this spoiled brat. She's awful and I hate her. What am I telling Charlie? What's my excuse for disappearing for? How long was I gone anyway? I tried to count the hours in my head. Just three days, his eyes tightened, but he smiled more naturally this time. Actually, I was hoping you might have a good explanation. I've got nothing. She was gone for three days. Three days with no way for Charlie to contact her or Alice. He would have been out of his mind with worry. Like, his best mate just died and his daughter, who he loves, has just disappeared for three days. And she has the audacity to be mad that he gives a shit about her. Maybe she just doesn't know what people giving a shit about her looks like because she's got Edward's weird, freaky behaviour normalised. She is awful. She's an awful child. She's an awful person. She's an awful character. She's an awful role model for teen girls. When I say that, I don't mean that, oh, characters in fiction must be good role models for teenagers or whatever. But the demographic for this is teenagers. And Maya thinks that Bella is a good person. Clearly. Maya also enjoyed the profit that came out of so many teenage girls, primarily imagining that they were Bella so they could have an Edward or a Jacob. She enjoyed the profit of that because it was, it was a sensational thing. Whatever. Edward tells Bella that he's been tracking for seven months. He hesitated and then spoke slowly, choosing his words of care. I wasn't hunting for food. I was actually trying my hand at tracking. I'm not very good at it. Yeah, he was trying to track Victoria and he's absolutely terrible at it. I didn't realise the mess I was leaving behind. I thought it was safe for you here, so safe. I had no idea that Victoria, his lips curled back when he said the name, would come back. So he never bothered to have someone just check up to make sure that Bella was safe. Some genius this is. Not that there's any excuse for what I left you to face. When I heard what you told Alice, what she saw herself, when I realised that you had to put your life in the hands of werewolves, immature, volatile, the worst thing out there besides Victoria herself. The wolf pack spent day and night defending Bella from Victoria. Not that Bella will defend them to Edward because she's bloody racist. Bella is like, it's not your fault. Isabella Marie Swan he whispered, the strange expression crossing his face. He looked almost mad. Do you believe that I asked the Volturi to kill me because I felt guilty? Don't get mad at her for believing when you said you didn't want her because she was boring or whatever. Gaslighter. <laughs> Edward admits he lied to her and he's always loved her. You weren't going to let go, he whispered. I could see that. I didn't want to do it. <laughs> you know I had to do it to him. It felt like it would kill me to do it. But I knew if I couldn't convince you that I didn't love you, it would just take you that much longer to get on with your life. I hoped that if you thought I'd moved on, so would you. What a flawless plan. Can't believe it didn't work. Exactly. But I never imagined it would be so easy to do. I thought it would be next to impossible that you'd be so sure of the truth that I would have to lie through my teeth for hours to even plant the seeds of doubt in your head. I lied and I'm so sorry. Sorry because I hurt you. Sorry because it was a worthless effort. Sorry that I couldn't protect you from what I am. I lied to save you, but it didn't work. I'm sorry. But how could you believe me? After all the thousand times I told you I love you, how could you let one word break your faith in me? <laughs> the way he's like, yeah, I lied to you, but you believed me. How dare you? Th this must be abusive. This must be emotional abuse, surely. Bella, he sighed. Really? What were you thinking? He is the worst. I'd rather be one of those tourists that the Volturi eats than hang out with Edward for even a moment. I'll prove you're awake, he promised. 
He is that a threat? He caught my face securely between his iron hands, ignoring my struggles when I turned my head away. He's going to do it. They're finally going to use tongues. Don't try to spare my feelings, please. Just tell me now whether or not you can still love me after everything I've done to you. Can you? He whispered. What kind of idiotic question is that? Just answer it, please. I stared at him darkly for a long moment. The way I feel about you will never change. Of course I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Honestly, pathetic. This entire book is his fault. If she actually, I hate the way that she took him back so easily. Like something happens in the clips as well when she's pissed off at him and then she just uh, sees him later anyway. Like, cause he does something super, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. Probably in two months time, we'll get to it. If she actually had a backbone, she'd make him sweat more. Maybe tell him she's seeing Jacob now just to stick the knife in. <laughs> Bitchy behavior would automatically be better than everything is forgiven. You put me through hell for seven months. I made your entire family ghost me, but it's okay because you always love me. That is so weak. It's so weak. This kiss was not quite as careful as others I remembered. Tongues. By the way, he said in a casual tone, I'm not leaving you. Please stop torturing me. Edward says he only left so Bella could have a normal life with no danger, but now she's gonna be in constant danger, so he must stay. Constant danger, that's his fault. It's his fault in the first place that Victoria wants to, okay. Don't promise me anything, I whispered. If I let myself hope and it came to nothing, that would kill me. Where all those merciless vampires had not been able to finish me off, hope would do the job. Anger glinted metallic in his black eyes. You think I'm lying to you now? How can you get mad at her for not believing him when he is a liar and he... Before you, Bella, my life was like a moonless night, very dark, but there were stars, points of light and reason. And then you shot across my sky like a meteor. Suddenly everything was on fire. There was brilliancy, there was beauty. When you were gone, when the meteor had fallen over the horizon, everything went black. Nothing had changed, but my eyes were blinded by the light. I couldn't see the stars anymore. And there was no more reason for anything. Have we met the same Bella Swan? Well, I would not call her a meteor. I'd call her the asteroid that finished off the dinosaurs. That's funny, I muttered. He arched one perfect eyebrow. Funny? I meant strange. I thought it was just me. Lots of pieces of me went missing too. I haven't been able to really breathe in so long. I filled my lungs, luxuriating in the sensation. And my heart, that was definitely lost. They're as bad as each other, so they are kind of perfect for each other in that regard, but it's just a codependent mess. It means that, even though I never expected any danger from Victoria, I wasn't going to let her get away with... Well, like I said, I was horrible at it. I traced her as far as Texas, but then I followed a false lead down to Brazil, and really she came here, he groaned. I wasn't even on the right continent. And all the while, worse than my worst fears. <laughs> How bad do you suck? Like, she was back in America. He was in Brazil. Let's not be hasty, I said, trying to hide my panic. Maybe she's not coming back. Jake's pack probably scared her off. There's really no reason to go looking for her. Besides, I've got bigger problems than Victoria. Edward's eyes narrowed, but he nodded. It's true. The werewolves are a problem. I snorted. I wasn't talking about Jacob. My problems are a lot worse than the handful of adolescent wolves getting themselves into trouble. Why is he such a speciesist? Edward says that time is different for the Volturi because they are so old and Bella will probably be 30 by the time they think of her. Then she freaks out about the idea of being 30. Calm down. Edward has no intention of turning Bella into a vampire to save her soul. They bicker and Bella decides to leave for the Cullen's house. This isn't just about you anymore. You're not the center of the universe, you know. My own personal universe was, of course, a different story. If you're going to bring the Volturi down on us over something as stupid as leaving me human, then your family ought to have a say. A say in what? He asked, each word distinct. My mortality. I'm putting it to a vote. Yeah, I bet Renee and Charlie would love a vote too, but they're not gonna get it, are they? Chapter 24, vote. I remembered that running through the forest like this used to frighten me, that I used to have to close my eyes. It seemed a silly reaction to me now. I kept my eyes wide, my chin resting on his shoulder, my cheek against his neck. The speed was exhilarating. A hundred times better than the motorcycle. Is this Bella's character development that she enjoys high octane thrilling activities now? <laughs> I'll earn your trust back somehow, he murmured, mostly to himself. If it's my final act. I trust you, I assured him. It's me I don't trust. How on earth does she trust him? And why doesn't she trust us? That's so weird. My attempt worked to an extent. He laughed, but his eyes retained the misery. Your things were never gone, he told me. I know it was wrong since I promised you peace without reminders. It was stupid and childish, but I want to leave some for myself with you. The CDs, the pictures, the tickets, they're all under your floorboards. What a freak. Bella tells Edward that she heard his voice when doing dangerous acts. 
What if you sincerely believed something was true, but you were dead wrong? What if you were so stubbornly sure that you were right that you wouldn't even consider the truth? Would the truth be silenced or would it try to break through? Option three, Edward loved me. The bond forged between us was not one that could be broken by absence, distance or time. And no matter how much more special or beautiful or brilliant or perfect than me he might be, he was as irreversibly altered as I was. As I would always belong to him, so would he always be mine. What babbling is this? Anyway, Bella now realises that Edward loves her, so she's happy again, magically. They go to the house and Bella tells them to vote on whether she should become a vampire or not. I think the only fair way to decide is for everyone to have a vote. If you decide you don't want me, then I guess I'll go back to Italy alone. I can't have them coming here. My forehead creases, I considered that. Why is she so insistent on killing herself for the Cullen's sake? She means nothing to them unless she's Edward's mate. They proved that by ghosting her, like they did when they broke up. It's so stupid. Edward tells them that Dimitri is a tracker who can follow the tenure of someone's mind. But seeing as vampiric abilities don't work on Bella, he thinks they won't be able to find her in Forks. They vote. Edward says no. Alice and Jasper, yes. Rosalie says no because she hates being a vampire. And Emmett and Esme say yes. I was still grimacing at that when I looked at Esme. Yes, of course, Bella. I already think of you as part of my family. Thank you, Esme, I murmured as I turned towards Carlisle. That is literally not true. And we can see in the book itself, no one checked on Bella in seven months, except for Alice. No. Does Mayer think that we can't retain information that we read? I am actually getting insulted that the author of this book thinks that we have the memory of an amoeba. She thinks that a cucumber retains information better than we do. Carlisle votes yes, so Edward has a tantrum. I flinched and spoke quickly. That's all I needed. Thank you for wanting to keep me. I feel exactly the same way about all of you. My voice was jagged with emotion by the end. She cares more about the Cullens than she does her actual parents and her parents are good, decent people who love her. Bella is like, well, Alice, shall we? Shall we do it now? No, 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 Edward roared. <laughs> that was me roaring. Charging back into the room. He was in my face before I had time to blink. Bending over, <laughs> I've read that as bending me over then. Whoo, finally getting to second base, are we? Bending over me, his expression twisted in rage. Are you insane? He shouted. Have you utterly lost your mind? I cringed away, my hands over my ears. He needs to calm down. He needs some milk. Bella asked Carlisle. Edward grabbed my face in his hand. For He's been very aggressive, forcing me to look at him. His other hand was out, palm towards Carlisle. Why is he manhandling her and screaming in her face? This is so abusive. Edward says you can't do it now. This was always the hardest part. Charlie, Renee, now Jacob too. The people I would lose, the people I would hurt. I wish there was some way that I could be the only one to suffer, but I knew that was impossible. Stop with the faux martyrdom. The faux, I wish only I would get hurt. You don't care about these people. At the same time, I was hurting them more by staying human, putting Charlie in constant danger through my proximity, putting Jake in worse danger still by drawing his enemies across the land he felt bound to protect. And Renee, I couldn't even risk a visit to see my own mother for fear of bringing my deadly problems along with me. I don't believe that she actually cares about them, but okay. Edward proposes that they wait until Bella graduates so it's less conspicuous for all of them. Edward takes Bella home and tries to bargain with her to wait five years and he will do the change. They bicker and then he says, you have to marry me first and then I'll do it. Yep, no sexy phallic vampire biting venom going through her veins like spunk in my Christian novel before marriage, please. Edward, please be serious. I'm 100% serious, he gazed at me with no hint of humour in his face. Oh, come on, I said, an edge of hysteria in my voice. I'm only 18. Well, I'm nearly 110. It's time I settled down. That is the funniest thing he's ever said. They wake Charlie up so Edward hides. I just about went crazy these last three days. I come home from Harry's funeral and you're gone. Jacob could only tell me that you'd run off with Alice Cullen and that he thought you were in trouble. You didn't leave me a number. You didn't call. I don't know where you were or when or if you were coming back. Do you have any idea how how he couldn't finish the sentence. He sucked in a sharp breath and moved on. Can you give me one reason why I shouldn't ship you off to Jacksonville this second? My eyes narrowed. So it was going to be frets, was it? Two could play at that game. I sat up pulling the quilt around me because I won't go. Like, you're not in a position to be bitchy. You really don't. Like, the, the hell you've put Charlie through. Justice for Charlie Swan. Bella has finally grown a pair of balls, but it's entirely projected at the wrong person. She is awful. Charlie wants to know where Bella had been. See, Alice told Rosalie about me jumping off the cliff. 
I was scrambling frantically to make this work, to keep it as close to the truth as possible so that my inability to lie convincingly would not undermine the excuse. But before I could go on, Charlie's expression reminded me that he didn't know anything about the cliff. Major oops, as if I wasn't already toast. What an idiot. Charlie's face was frozen. Were you trying to kill yourself, Bella? No, of course not. Just having fun with Jake. Cliff diving. The Lapush kids do it all the time. Like I said, nothing. Charlie's face heated up from frozen to hot with fury. What's it to Edward Cullen anyway, he barked. All this time he just left you dangling without a word. I interrupted him. Another misunderstanding. It's not a misunderstanding. He left you in a forest and ghosted you and went through your stuff to make sure there was no memory of him in your... So weird. He shook his head, the vein in his forehead pulsing. I want you to stay away from him, Bella. I don't trust you. He's rotten for you. I won't let him mess you up like that again. Charlie's right. Fine, I said curtly. Charlie rocked back onto his heels. Oh, he scrambled for a second, exhaling loudly in surprise. I thought you were going to be difficult. I am, I stared straight into his eyes. I meant fine, I'll move out. Go get a plane, go back to Italy, go back to the Volturi and get eaten. Dad, I don't want to move out, I said in a softer tone. I love you. I know you're worried, but you need to trust me on this. Why? Like, you've not shown that you're trustworthy at all. And you're going to have to ease up on Edward if you want me to stay. Do you want me to live here or not? That's not fair, Bella. You know I want you to stay. Then be nice to Edward because he's going to be where I am, I said with confidence. The conviction of my epiphany was still strong. Not under my roof, Charlie stormed. I sighed a heavy sigh. Look, I'm not going to give you any more ultimatums tonight, or I guess it's this morning. Just think about it for a few days, okay? But keep in mind that Edward and I are sort of a package deal. She dated him for six months. He ditched her for seven. They've been back together for a day. Charlie stomps off. If I were him, I would actually just throw her out. Oh, where's your confidence now? Just chuck her out, make her go live with the Cullens because she loves them so bloody much. She should marry all of them. Edward is back and then they express their feelings to each other again. Epilogue treaty. <sighs> Can't believe I managed to do most of this in one go. No, yeah, it's half two. Brilliant. Brilliant. Charlie was not happy with me or speaking to Edward. Why the hell should he? With Edward back in place, it was almost as if the last eight months were just a disturbing nightmare. So easy, so convenient, just like that. Brilliant. I wasn't at liberty to go to La Push and Jacob wasn't coming to see me. He wouldn't even answer my phone calls. Why should he? Uh, he must realise at this point that Bella just used him for an entire book to distract herself from Edward. I chose that time to make my fruitless calls because I'd noticed that Edward made a certain face every time I mentioned Jacob's name. Sort of disapproving and wary, maybe even angry. I guess that he had some reciprocal prejudice against the werewolves, though he wasn't as vocal as Jacob had been about the bloodsuckers. So I didn't mention Jacob much. He should be thankful that they protected her against Laurie and Victoria, but no, speciesist. With Edward near me, it was hard to think about unhappy things. Even my former best friend, who was probably, they were best friends for like two days, I swear, who was probably feeling very unhappy right now due to me. When I did think of Jacob, I always felt guilty for not thinking of him more. See, Bella is that girl, the one who ditches all of her friends for a boy every time she starts dating someone new for like a week. So though I didn't mention Jacob much, sometimes my frustration and anxiety balled over. It's just plain rude, I vented one Saturday afternoon when Edward picked me up from work. Being angry about things was easier than feeling guilty. Downright insulting. Well, Bella, you can't have it all, I'm afraid. Unless your best friend falls in love with your newborn child. And then I guess you can have it all. It's not you, Bella, Edward said quietly. Nobody hates you. Ha! Wrong! Shut up! Edward says that he and Jacob would probably fight and Jacob would probably get killed. Swoon, so dreamy. Abruptly, I remembered what happened to Paris when Romeo came back. The stage directions were simple. They fight. Paris falls. Maya, you're not Shakespeare. Please stop it, please. Edward takes Bella home, where Bella's motorcycle is in the driveway and Charlie is inside the house furious. No, I gasped. Why? Why would Jacob do this to me? The sting of betrayal washed through me. I had trusted Jacob implicitly, trusted him with every single secret I had. He was supposed to be my safe harbour, the person I could rely on. Of course, things were strained now, but I didn't think any of the underlying foundation had changed. I didn't think that was changeable. Why does Bella expect everyone to have, like, undying loyalty to her when the only people she has loyalty to are the Cullens? Think about it. That stuff in the beginning, like, oh, why won't... Why oh, won't Jess forgive me, like, blah, 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 even though I was being a freak? Or, oh, Mike's not, Mike's not following me around to lessons anymore, which, you know, <sighs> Bella gets so mad at Jacob that she wants to hit him. Yeah, right. She and Edward go to talk. Why, I whispered, trying to hide the sound of the lump in my throat. How could you do this to me, Jacob? The sneer vanished, but his face stayed hard and rigid. It's for the best. 
What is that supposed to mean? Do you want Charlie to strangle me? Or did you want him to have a heart attack like Harry? No matter how mad you are at me, how could you do this to him? Emotional damage. How is it that Edward can ghost her for seven months and she's like, lol, whatever babes, I love you too, hee <laughs> hee. But Jacob is like, I'm not keeping your secrets anymore, dude. And Bella is like, you're the worst person ever. How dare you? You're gonna kill Charlie. That is like really manipulative. That is so manipulative. But yes, of course, Bella only really truly cares for Edward because it's funny how she didn't once think of Charlie's heart while she was off gallivanting around Italy. Jake just wanted Bella to be grounded so she wouldn't spend time with Edward. And that is so deliciously juvenile kind of approve. He also thought Edward was stopping her from going to La Push. Thank you, Edward said, and his voice throbs. That's not the only thing that's throbbing. With the depth of his insincerity. I will never be able to tell you how grateful I am. I will owe you for the rest of my existence. Jacob stared at him blankly, his shudders stilled by surprise. He exchanged a quick glance with me, but my face was just as mystified. For keeping Bella alive, Edward clarified, his voice rough and fervent, when I didn't. Edward has been nothing but derogatory towards the wolf pack and about them to Bella. So I do not believe this in the slightest. I think he's being fake woke, faux progressive, champagne socialist. Jacob kept his eyes on Edward. I just needed to remind your blood sucking friends of a few key points in the treaty they agreed to. The treaty that is the only thing stopping me from ripping out his throat right this minute. There's no need to be this edgy mate. Jake tells them that the treaty prevents a vampire from biting a human, not just killing. And Bella is like, that's none of your business. And then Jacob gets so angry, he almost shits himself. Charlie starts yelling from the house. Sorry, he whispered so low that I had to read his lips to understand. Bye, Bells. You promised I reminded him desperately. Still friends, right? Ugh. Jacob shook his head slowly and the lump in my throat nearly strangled me. You know how hard I've tried to keep that promise, but I can't see how to keep trying. Not now. He struggled to keep his hard mask in place, but it wavered and then disappeared. Miss you, he mouthed. One of his hands reached toward me, his fingers outstretched, like he wished they were long enough to cross the distance between us. Why should he stay friends with her? She is so annoying. And right there, I vowed I would see him smile, and soon I would find a way to keep my friend. Why is she so insistent? Anyway, the book ends with Bella getting ready to be yelled at by Charlie. The end. I did it. So to sum up, codependent nightmare, awful. It, a book of Bella moping around whilst everyone else does stuff. And remember teen girls, no matter how awful a boy is to you, if he says sorry after a seven month ghosting period, then just forgive him immediately because he's so dreamy. And that's all for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for staying along this journey with me oh my god this is gonna be a long one in it this might be my longest yet we'll find out in the edit please remember to like comment and subscribe it's very important for helping out the channel i think i deserve a like for this monster of a video if you want me to do eclipse then you're gonna have to support this one make sure you check out my podcast channel where i'm doing stuff over there make sure you check out my second channel where i do shorter content and upload my shorts and check out my tiktok as well and if you want to support me there's a patreon as well i think that's all i'm tired i'm gonna go to bed and sleep for a few hours and then start editing this horror show thanks stephanie mayer very cool and thank you to extra for sponsoring today's video see you all next time bye